All right, everyone. Sorry about that. You you intend to start at a certain time, and then uh, I was multitasking this morning. And sometimes when you have guests, you send the wrong link at another another show in the in the my my backstage, and I send Dr. Johnson the wrong link. So uh, that's my bad. All right. So welcome. Tonight, we are going to discuss the now 18-point black male uh, political agenda. So me and Dr. Johnson, we huddled up back in October of 2023, I think it was. Time is flying by. So we huddled up back then, and I have my copy of his book here. If you don't have a copy of it, you should go get a copy of it. And uh, the final chapter is is the what was the 17 point uh, black male agenda, and uh, a, a new point was recently added. So Dr. Johnson is going to talk to us about uh, about that. But uh, yeah, I thought this would be a this this is Black history in the making. I mean, we've never I don't think the country's ever seen something like this a black male political agenda, and I thought it would be with this being an election year. I thought it would be fun and uh, very, very educational for uh, us to revisit that chapter. We kind of, I stretched it out. Uh, we did a little marathon. Well, for me, we stretched it out for about two hours. And so by the end, we were just finishing up. And I thought it would be cool to come back and just focus on that. So that's what we're going to do. So I'm going to play uh, this intro. Uh, I'm making up the intros specific to my guests now. And then me and Dr. Johnson, we're going to talk about the 18-point black male agenda. Thank you to everyone who's here already. Please smash the like button. Uh, if you are new, please consider subscribing. If you want to throw something in the collection plate throughout this discussion, my Cash App and PayPal, let me slow down. My Cash App and PayPal are here, and the Super Chat is live. So I will see you all on the other side of the intro and uh yeah let's uh let's jump in let's learn something because of where i come from see in this world we're all living in in different worlds and not everybody is privy to the same information look it took me a long time to accept that black women have been pondering politics that work in their interests for generations Black men have never been acculturated to doing that, in my humble opinion. I think we were, many of us are, 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 have been working with that Black communal idea that goes back to the 60s and 70s. We weren't thinking of politics specifically in our interests as Black men. We were thinking about Black community. So as we started to reflect upon how, you know, even in the last few elections, these women are functioning in a manner that is about them, not about the community. We're caught between either we try and convince them to operate communally or we actually start to think about ourselves or some combination of both. But this is where the 17 point black male political agenda comes in, because even if you watch presidential candidates who only show up every four years and maybe have one conversation with black men in some kind of symbolic, you know, uh, barbershop and ask them questions about what they want politically. Most of those brothers had generic answers that were really about black community. They were addressing racism, not specific to black men. They, you know, a lot, very few of these guys ever sat down and said, well, looking at the data, this is what black men are going through. They talked about blackness. They talked about community. Because of where I come from, see in this world, we're all living in, in different worlds and not everybody is privy to the same information. We're all living in different worlds and not everybody is privy to the same information. So everyone, yeah, as I described, I thought that this would, this is definitely a uh, an appropriate topic for uh, Black History Month 2024. Uh, I don't know that it's the Black history that a lot of folks would expect. I know that in my particular home, based upon where I come from, I don't think anybody has ever heard or even thought of a black male political agenda. I know my mom and her cohort, that black baby boomer generation, 
I, I think they think about things in terms of uh, Democrats and Republicans, okay? And they think about us as a people as one homogenous group. But I think they will all be surprised to watch this. My mother's watching my content now. And um, I, I, I can proudly share this with her. And she will be surprised. And I think my aunts and uncles, when they see this, they'll be surprised. Because a lot of people don't know. They don't know that this exists. And they don't know that there has been a need for something like this. And they don't know that these divisions, well, they, they, don't, they don't know that the environment has been bubbling, has been evolving to the point where something like this would evolve. Dr. Johnson is backstage. So to set the stage for him to come up, I, I'm just going to show this really, really quickly. He said on his show recently, he's not telling anybody how to vote. I'm not telling anybody how to vote either. Okay. Let me, let me make that clear right from uh, the jump. There is a lot of, uh, there are, are a lot of subplots to this 2024 election. Uh, and one of the things that we're seeing and we're hearing is a, a shakeup in terms of the Democratic coalition. Okay, shout out to Diamond Dave. Diamond Dave, when well, well on his channel, I don't think we talked about it when he came here to my channel. Uh, but uh, these elections are won based upon coalitions. So groups of people, sometimes with varying interests, but each candidate has to put together the most solid coalition that they can. And one of the things we're hearing about now is that, uh, well, President Biden's coalition is kind of breaking off in, in, in certain areas and in certain ways due to multiple reasons. But the concern has always been for that particular party, how much of the black, are we always going to get our black vote the way we've always gotten it? And if we don't get our black vote, then what do we do? So there's concern also for what's happening with the black vote, all right? And and there were, this was also very concerning for the 2020 election. So that article, it says, a fraying coalition, black, Hispanic, young voters abandoned Biden as election year begins, okay? So just keep that in the back of your mind as we talk about this. And again, we're not telling anybody who to vote for. There's also, there's also, I heard that that side is getting some heat for the Israeli-Palestine thing. Now, the other thing is, I mentioned my mom. She's watching my content, so she'll watch this. Hey, mom, how you doing? One of the things she said to me before the new year was, you know, you should do more, you know, more, more black center content. And I do, I, I, I do. I hop around a little bit. But she also said, you should show statistics when you make your content. And me and Dr. T, we're going to talk about that. So you guys know, Saul Chi knows he, he's there. He's from the financial sector. I've become enamored with this data set. This goes back to my median household income stream. And I've become enamored with this data set. And we're probably going to ride this out until the 2023 numbers come out. This is the median household income for 2022 in the United States. So for all races slash ethnicities, the value, the number is uh, $74,580. For Asian families, for Asian households, the value is $108,700 for median household income. For white non-Hispanics, it's $81,060. For Hispanics, any race, it's $62,800. And look who is bringing up the rear there. So black people uh, are bringing up the rear there with $52,860. $52,860. So I've asked this rhetorical question since I first presented this. How do you explain those numbers? How do you account for those numbers? And I'm going to challenge all the viewers and the audience, whether you're watching live on the playback, how does this relate to this 18 point uh, black male political agenda? I had to make sure that I got it right there because what's interesting is Dr. Johnson will tell us about this, but someone from the media class, the, the fourth estate, had the chance to talk about economics. And it seems that black men are very interested in economics, but he didn't quite communicate that. Uh, political 
uh, agenda item in the most transparent or truthful way. So with that, everyone, I'm going to zip it and I'm going to welcome back Dr. T. Hassan Johnson. Dr. Johnson, welcome back. Oh, thank you, man. I appreciate you uh, inviting me in. No problem. I appreciate you coming. And I, I think everybody there in the chat, they've been, you know, they're all lined up <laughs> to, hear, to hear this uh, this Q&A. All right. I appreciate it. Shout out to everybody that came through. Salute. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, so I have some questions here. We're not going not gonna to do the whole marathon tonight, but we're we're gonna we're gonna uh, get it in. So, welcome back to my channel, Dr. Johnson. Um, we had a uh, discussion about Black Panther a year or so ago on, on my media channel, mm -hmm. and recently we had a discussion about your your book, Solutions for um, Anti Black Misandry, Flat Blackness, and Black Male Death. Mm -hmm. um, everybody in the chat knows who you are, but for individuals like my mom, like I could keep, keep mentioning her. Do you want to uh, say, say a few words about uh, who you are and what you do? Uh, because I think it's, it's it's worth noting. Uh, you know, you're from the academy, so this isn't just anybody. Everyone, this is this is someone well 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 read, well studied, and uh, he's done a lot of uh, good uh, scholarly work. Well, uh, first and foremost, uh, you know, hello to your mother. <laughs> 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 you raised a good one, ma'am. You raised a good thank one. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I'm I'm faculty uh, in Africana Studies at Fresno State. I've been there about 15 years. Um, uh, ugh, I mean, I don't know what else to you know what else to share about that. Um, uh, been teaching at the university level for 25. Had my doctorate since 2008, um, and initially um, my work was was more generic. Africana studies, hip hop, it was really more generic. But often what you find is that the thing that you're really, you know, drawn to most in life, you've probably been doing it in one way, shape or form, even if you didn't know it. So a lot of my early work dealing with generic Africana studies and hip hop was really always gravitating toward black men. I was just doing it through other means without really knowing what I was gravitating toward. And, you know, and there really wasn't the kind of straightforward field on black men that we're we're aware of now with the advent of black male studies with, you know, Dr. Tommy Curry, myself and, and several others. We, you know, it wasn't that straightforward 15 years ago. So, you know, it, it, it took some time to kind of unravel the onion, as it were, to get to what it is I was most drawn to. And that, you know, that started a whole nother journey, which led to this real, you know, this this focus on where black men are now. And what black men need, men and boys, and and raising questions that we really hadn't answered before, uh, but we now have the benefit of social media. And what this does is it allows everyday men. I don't care if you're couch surfing and and you know all you got is a smartphone, or if you're a CEO or you run a bank or you're a university president. And and I don't use those examples, you know, uh, frivolously. I've I've talked to men in each of the categories I just named. Social media provided us with a level field where regardless of your class background, your upbringing, your, your, your occupation, we can actually communicate and compare notes. And this is what's been happening in social media spaces and in the, in the academy, right? The, the development of Black Male Studies has pushed some scholars into a, a, you know, a, a method of doing research that we hadn't done before. But in social media, you have brothers coming together and comparing notes about relationship. Well, it started about, you know, relationships, but it evolved into all these different areas. And as you have black men and boys uh, comparing notes and sharing their experiences, we started to be able to theorize on what it is we were experiencing. And in the last uh, 10 years, I would say that discussion has actually come quite a ways. Now, you got a lot of different branches to it. So it's not, you know, any unilateral one way kind of thing. It's a very fraught and freighted uh, field of discussions, but it is nonetheless a variety of fields of overlapping discussions on all kinds of topics. And we're just now starting to weigh the possibility of taking this discussion and leveraging it in regard to politics. And that's where we're at. So, Okay. I think that's, that's interesting because, well, as you know, this particular sector of YouTube, the, the black manosphere, quote unquote, it has a mm -hmm. negative stigma to it for a lot of people. And mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm, there's always a new group, who who's has something to say 
Uh, and one of the questions is, well, what's coming out of all those discussions? You know, those, those men over there, they're just talking and talking and talking. What's coming out of those discussions? Um, first, first and foremost, you have to know, again, we've never had this opportunity. So you got, look, there are brothers here in their 70s and there are brothers here who are, you know, just getting past 10 years old. You know, and, and that's a huge swath of the population. And they're having discussions we've never been able to have in live time. So, it, it, you know, one thing that's that's going to take time. But two, um, the real problem that I think people have with, uh, you know, spaces like the Manosphere is they're not regulated. They're not controlled by any institution that we can point to. It's not being controlled by the academy. It's not being controlled by, you know, the shortest. The, the, the only thing you could probably point to are those who own the spaces like YouTube, Google, you know, to the extent that they allow for people to have this dialogue. That's about as close as it gets. But. The problem with, say, the academy is, you know, most brothers in the academy that may want to have these conversations can't because they have to worry about blowback. They have to worry about getting fired. They have to worry about, you know, colleagues and even strangers attacking them. But in this kind of free space, you have all kinds of unregulated opportunity for dialogue. Now, sometimes that can be, you know, egregious, but other times it can actually produce uh, ideas out of free thought that we never would have gotten if it was regulated by any one space. So I'm not, I'm not suggesting that this space is sanitary and clean. It can be quite bloody, but you know what? There's, there's also opportunity that comes out of that kind of thing at the same time. So I'm not saying every part of the manosphere is something that everybody's going to like, not at all. But at the end of the day, what discussion actually is when you really get down to the nuts and bolts of it, what, what, what discussion do you agree with a hundred percent of what you hear? Yeah. And the manosphere is never, tried to suggest that that was the case, that it was it was uh, media friendly, that it was politically correct. I think the question was, what can come out of a discussion where there are very few rules and nobody to over, you know provide oversight and tell people what to do, what to think, what the conclusion should be? What happens when you have a truly free discussion where people get to leverage their interests regardless of what they are? Oh, so, yeah. OK. I want to acknowledge everyone uh, in the chat, but my, my brother is also there. So he says, uh, salute, Dr. T. It's great to see you back. Oh, that's what's up. That's your brother. Yeah, all right. yeah he's, he's, a, he's a comic book uh, superhero head, just like <laughs> that's, right. that's right. right. That's and right. once again, salute to everybody who's who's here. Please smash that like button if you're coming in. Before we uh, move on really, really quickly, how's your sabbatical going? <laughs> Man, it's going all right, man. I'm all just right. I'm, I'm disconnected from the, you know the proper time span, so I'm going to bed at four and five and waking up at three. You know, I'm all off, so I just got to get it together. But um, yeah, but so far it's been cool. It's been okay, cool. one one of the perks of the uh, academy. <laughs> right at all kinds of the day and night, and you know, just be completely disconnected. So mm. I got to get on it. I got to get on it. But YouTube okay. keeps me on it, so it, it keeps me waking up at some point in the daytime. So for those who don't know, a sabbatical, that, that, that when you're a tenure professor, uh, that, that's time you, you have to yourself to write and to think of new ideas and to uh, yeah. further your research, independent a, of teaching classes or... Right, right. It, I remember I had this discussion once with a, an appliance repairman, and he came over and he was fixing my, my stove, and he found out I was a professor, and he got real pissed off because he was basically like, you guys don't do any real work. So when I started to explain to him the process of getting tenure um, and, and whatnot, sabbatical, all these kind of things, he ended up shaking my hand before he left. And really all I told him is, you know, and you know this as well, even though you're in the sciences, so it may be a little different for you. But traditionally, you know, it, it, once you finish your doctorate, you apply for what's called a tenure track position. If one day you want tenure, if it's available, if you get that. Now, understand, getting a job in the academy takes a year unto itself. Right. You apply in the fall interview in the spring, you move in the summer and you start the following fall, right? And once you get in that position at most universities, if you want tenure, that can take you anywhere around a decade where you just do a grip of work in most places and hope you get it. And tenure basically just means that, you know, you pretty much have a job for life as long as the university thinks you're worth the investment. But once you do that, you know, um, you're still expected to produce. You're still, still expected to do research and teach. And you're supposed to break ground in new areas in some fat, form or fashion. And that's not as easy as it sounds. You know, usually to get tenure, you have to publish. And that means that you not only have to do research on a new area, 
write something that hasn't been really done before, which is essentially what a dissertation is, but also what your publications are. You're constantly supposed to be breaking new ground. Then you have to find somebody willing to publish publish it. You know, and if you're doing anything controversial, that can work for you or you or against you. So a lot of people avoid controversy because they don't want the blowback. But at the end of the day, no matter what you produce, you, you usually got to find somebody reputable to publish it. Usually a university press or something. So it's not like you're just writing a bunch of stuff and putting it out yourself. I mean, you can do that, but that's not what the academy respects. So you have to publish through certain channels. And if they don't approve of it or if they won't publish it, it's almost like you didn't write anything. And you still have this ticking clock over your head that you have to produce in, by a certain time period or else if you don't have tenure yet. You can lose that job entirely. So imagine getting a job and they say, OK, well, we're not going to tell you how long it takes, but you need to publish a bunch of stuff at some point and maybe you'll get tenure or maybe you'll just lose your job. Can you imagine the kind of pressure you're under for that? I mean, it may not sound like much, but when you're sitting in it, you got your kids in your house and you're paying bills and so on and so forth. And, you know. I have to, to produce something, get it published, and then do it again. And I have an unclear period of time to do the, to do this in. And I hope that there's some institution out there that's willing to publish what I produced. Hope you know. Hopefully, they like it well enough. And peer reviewers who are reading it, your peers in the academy, will find value in it and give you. You know, this this is a system, and it's a process, and it's 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 a community of sorts. None of that is easy. There's no guarantees that any of these things will happen. So you spend years. I mean, I went for I went to college from 1992 to 2008, from bachelor's to doctorate. You spend years in school. And then, you know, as you're producing these things, it's in the air as to whether or not, you know, you'll be able to to be able to follow through. So it's really a lot. And sabbatical comes in where uh, you get an opportunity to take a semester or a year depending on your situation to do research on a whole new area. And for me. I'm pushing uh, is really the, the next stage beyond uh, the book I just wrote that came out this past August. So, you know, solutions for anti-black and basically this is the, the next section. This is beyond that. This book really provides the foundation for the argument. And I think in many ways, the foundation for the arguments that we use both in the manosphere and in black male studies, you know, it provides some foundational arguments, some key citations that I think, you know, kind of you know, ground some of our central arguments because you hear people arguing all the time online and, you know, the information changes, the data changes, and there's often not a way to cite a lot of that stuff when we're just going back and forth. So the book is an opportunity to say, here, go through the index, go through the citations, go through and look at the notes and you can see what the, you know, the different types of citations are that you can use to, you know, build upon and embellish upon the arguments that we're already making. So this book is is kind of providing a, a, a background for that. And we can begin to move forward uh, and continue to document our arguments and our sources. And you know this as well, uh, Dr. Uh, it, when, when you're citing things online, that article can disappear real fast. That whatever that documentation you found was and you've been telling people about and somebody says, well, let me see it. And you go, oh, yeah, OK. And you hit the link, go to it, gone. And it can be hard to, to find, you know, so on and so forth. So at times, you know, so we have to document to make sure that uh, our arguments are clear. And that's why I show a lot of stuff in my show on the screen. A lot of the articles I read, a lot of the documents I read, because even if it changes, I want you to know it was there at one point mm -hmm. and you can see what it actually said and we can go from there. So, mm -hmm. yeah, but I hope yeah. I answered the question. So. Yeah. So certainly in this digital age, things can be put up and they can be removed if yes. the powers that be don't want people to see it. Yeah. Okay. And information, knowledge is power. Information and knowledge are power. Okay, everyone, we're going to dive back in. Everyone, if you super chat, I don't know if Andre is out there, but please protect the protect the content creator. I mean, I mean, make, make sure they're constructive. I shouldn't have to say that. <laughs> you, you probably think it's funny that I'm saying that, but people are going to watch this one. People mm -hmm. have never heard of this. So it, 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 we want this one to uh, get out and, and, uh, yeah, we want folks to be able to di digest it. So it's just a little a little request there. So Dr. Johnson, so I think I think I forgot to ask you this in our last talk. Have you ever with 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 advocating for black men and boys and asking some of the questions you ask, have you ever been accused? Uh, I'm gonna say the word, have you ever been accused of misogyny? 
uh, <laughs> since you started this work. And how <laughs> you're laughing, you're laughing, but when somebody when somebody hurls that at you and you're not used to it, uh, you're like, <gasps> um, you know, so have, have you ever been uh, uh, accused of that? And uh, how do you how do you respond when someone throws that your way? Well, I discovered a, a while ago that that's become almost meaningless. I mean, essentially at this point, especially in social media, you know, when someone calls you a misogynist, usually I thought it used to mean that you have a hatred for women that they have verified and they're, you know, but what I found was it, it usually means you're saying something that they're either uncomfortable with or they don't like the fact that you're saying it, right? It's become a blanket term that has very little meaning these days, but I have heard that. And nine times out of 10, when I asked them, I said, okay. What exactly did I say that suggests that I'm a misogynist? Usually there's silence, right? And if you push, which I tend to do sometimes, um, you know, okay, well, you know, you made this statement. So where are you getting it from? Well, I don't like the titles of your videos. Okay. That's it. That's what made me. Okay. Well, or, or and this is what I get the most. Well, I don't like what some of the guys in the comment section, section say. Okay. But what did I say? What argument did I put forth? that puts me in this position of hating women. I'm documenting what's going on with black men. I'm documenting what's happening to black men in relationships with to in individuals and institutions. Tell me what exactly, what argument did I put forth that suggests that I hate women? Well, you're critical of women. Yeah, I'm critical of institutions, cultural practices, individuals. Yes, I am critical of women and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. What exactly makes that misogyny though? Well, you, well, you just say things that I don't like. Okay, that's, you know, so the, 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 that tends to be the nature of the discussions I've had with people that have done that. And, you know, after a while, you're just like, all right, whatever. You know, I, I, I can only take that so seriously, you know, but to me, it, it really gets to the crux of what are the arguments on the table? How do these arguments and issues that we're bringing up actually affect people in real life? And if you're not having that level of dialogue, I tend to check out. But yeah, I've heard it and it's, those kind of, you know, they're, they're superficial attacks that have less to do with the arguments that we're creating and more to do with distracting and deflecting from the discussion and shaming as a way of trying to get people to stop saying what you don't like to hear. That's where I, you know, that's my experience with that. Yeah. So silencing, yeah. silencing you, silencing the yeah. other person. Because now we don't have to continue talking about what I was raising. Now we can make this whole discussion about, you know, how much I must hate somebody and, you know, what is it? Who hurt you and what my past was. But we now we're deflecting from the subject on the table, which could have been anything. Right. But now we're not talking about that. And that's the point. Now we're not talking about what the discussion initially was. And we're going on this strange diatribe about, you know, what my motivations must be as a deflective measure. And I find that to be the case sometimes, too. Okay. All right. So in our last discussion, again, we squeezed in chapter five at the end. So I appreciate you coming back so we can unpack it a little bit more. Sure. Now, it, it, you know, and we're, we're going to talk about this, but one of the things I'm sure you've heard this saying your, yourself within the black community uh, to, to kind of uh, rally up and round up everybody to come vote Democrat, you hear the saying vote blue, no matter who. So you know, yeah. everybody get on board. We're getting on this train. Get on board. Vote blue no matter who. The first time I saw it was on Facebook from someone. Mm -hmm. I imagine, I imagine since you've uh, put this agenda together, I imagine you've heard the question. If you haven't, you put, then you probably will. What, you know, why, why, why would we need, why do we need a black male agenda? Why can't we just have a, a black agenda isn't this divisive isn't this dividing the vote well and that's that's what i liked about the clip you played at the beginning because um i think in many ways black men have been operating off of that paradigm for de for decades for generations uh, most particularly through the civil rights and black power movement eras you'll notice a lot of the policy proposals that came out of those time periods were very black community focused this is one of the reasons i think that we were wholly unprepared for the impact of feminism most particularly Black feminism. We really were unprepared because to this day, when average black men are asked those questions politically, what do you need? What, what's going on? We still tend to ask answer in very generic terms about the black community. Women are not 
going by that. And they haven't been. It's really snowballed since the 1980s, but they have been on track to really identifying themselves almost as a separate demographic. And I know this is difficult sometimes for older generations to really perceive. A lot of the older generations just think we're crazy. (laughs) It's a lot of unnecessary back and forth, but really a lot of what they don't understand is if you're not, if you're not single and kind of looking at this commu- this this dialogue that's going on now, you you tend to miss it. If you've been married for twenty plus years and you're an older person, you're probably not seeing what the tensions are on the ground. But you know, and I say that out of experience. I was I was you know married for nine years with my wife for eleven. I was oblivious to a lot of this until I became single again. And after she passed, and I'm in this single world, I'm seeing this tension that had grown in proportion from before I got married. It really had changed the tone of it. And a lot of that, I thought, okay, well, this is just in the dating world, but no, it was, it, you saw the connections in the political world, social world, the professional white collar world, in the academy, in the corporate world. I mean, I did an interview with Kevin Samuels and he talked about his experiences in the corporate world and the hostility extended to black men by black women in the corporate world. Well, we're seeing the same thing politically. This, this, this split is really something you have to witness. And if you're not part of those discussions and your life doesn't bring you into contact with that, you can tend to be fairly oblivious about how bad it really is, but it's severe. So now we're in a political moment where you have black women going for the gold in terms of, you know, elite positions, in terms of political positions, and that's all well and good. But a lot of the kind of policy interests they have have nothing to do with not even boys, let alone men. It's a severe line. One of the best ways to look at it, and I've been talking about this since uh, the pandemic, when, starting in 2020, we were we were starting to observe how many mom and pop black owned businesses were getting support during that time period. And we were starting to find that more and more it was earmarked for black women. Right? And I kind of put a challenge out there to my listeners. I said, let me know if you find anything that's offered specifically for black males. The only time I ever had somebody answer the question, it was because they identified a grant that was earmarked for black men and had gone defunct before the pandemic. But there really wasn't a lot for black men out there. We started to notice that. And when we started to see larger corporations, Goldman Sachs, Google, Visa, MasterCard, all these companies, these major corporations that were earmarking opportunities for black women, nothing for black men. We started to notice. And then from there, it continued to advance. And now we're seeing, especially by the time they started making demands on Biden to um, to have his vice president be a black woman, right? That was one of the moments, you know, I call it a black masculinist turn. It's one of these moments where we start to realize that it isn't 1973. You know what I mean? It's a very different situation and black women are being courted to operate on their own and they're answering the call to do so in many respects. And black men are still operating in a zone and in a method that I think is no longer practical and requires that we adapt and pivot and actually take our own situation into consideration moving forward, you know, politically, socially and otherwise. So I think that's kind of, you know, where we are. And I think that's what's necessary. And we're, we're still getting used to it. So what I tend to find is even brothers that are nowhere near thinking about black political, inter- black male political interests will tend to read through the list and go, oh, yeah. I mean, if you have any degree of life experience, you know, if you're 15 living at home, you may not see it. But if you have some life experience under your belt and you start to read through the list, you start to say, you know what, I I hadn't considered that, you know. And the way, you know, as you pointed out as well, I do that in a bipartisan fashion, you know, because I'm I'm, I'm an independent. And I tend to find that brothers from all ideological spectrums have something in common independent of their ideology. And that's often their life experience as black men. So if you're talking about, uh, you know, the the judicial system, whether you're talking about, you know, law enforcement, whether you're talking about child rearing, you know, black men have certain experiences that they can understand whether they're conservative or liberal, whether they're progressive, whether they're revolutionary pan-Africanists, you know, or whether they're just completely void of any kind of political whatever. And and that even goes across religion. I've run into brothers that are Hebrew Israelites, Muslims, uh, atheists, you know what I mean? Regardless of their religious or political ideology, when you start going through the lives of black men and what kinds of policy ideas would help improve the quality of life, you'd be surprised how many brothers actually share the same outlook despite their differences. This is one of the reasons on my channel, we don't go into 
you know, the specific, I don't, I don't go into a specific party or religious orientation and say, this is where the truth is. And that's it. Cause you're going to alienate everybody. But if you actually just create a space where you say, okay, what do black boys and men need? Cause that's the only requirement for the black male political agenda, which is an unfinished living document. It is something that we can add on to ad infinitum. It, there's no ending to it. It's only at 18 points. I'm not suggesting it needs to stay there. That's just where it is. It can continue, we can continue to add to it. But when you put that there and the only requirement is, does your idea improve the quality of life for black men and boys? That's it. I don't care what political you know, background you come from. I don't care about your ideology. I don't care about your religious orientation. What will improve the quality of life? And then once you make the idea, we look at it. Hopefully you've included some data. We can you go about it from there and we decide, you know, and go forward. But the list, as it were, up to this point comes from a cross section of brothers that have all kinds of different backgrounds and experiences, right? So it doesn't come from any one center except for those who listen to the Onyx Report and, uh, you know, and communicate on their ideas. Okay. So, wow, there was a, a lot there. So, so first, so yeah, there are people well, in the community, particularly the, the, the elder generations, they're not in the know of everything that's happened past the point of them getting married if they were one of the fortunate couples to get married and stay married for a long period of time if if your life is well as an example everyone if your life is going to church and in, in mm -hmm. the in the city in a particular city maybe the one you grew up in that that's your life going there and coming home and you watch specific news outlets or you read specific magazines then you wouldn't know if you're not on right. social media you wouldn't know right. what's happening out here so hypothetically, you could get to election day and you might be looking at the results and saying, what happened? <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. how, how did this happen? Mm -hmm. So, OK, that that's that's an important point. I didn't hear anything misogynistic in, in what you said. And also. <laughs> and also, I think it's important that you stated you're not urging anyone to. Towards one side or the other, because right now in this country, it's like red team, blue team. Right, right. Without, and without I think looking, go ahead. I think this thing is black men. I think many of us understand that there's no real trust on either side of it for us. I mean, in one vein, um, you know, and I, I think I asked you this the last time we spoke, but I tend we, you know, I tend to talk to black men, and I'll tend to ask them this question: Have you noticed a, a critical change in the quality of your life under either party? Right. You know, whose politic? I mean, what policies do you see either party addressing that are specific to us? that impact us in one way or another. That's why I think even in the last election for brothers that didn't vote for Trump or Biden and were just, you know, they didn't care where it went because they knew their quality of life really wasn't going to change to any significant degree. And, and when we started hearing black women, you know, real die hard about voting blue and we saw some of the things that happened with Biden, you know, we were just leaning against the wall like, you know, now what? I mean, for, for us, the journey for any type of economic security, employment, consistencies, being able to support families and so on and so forth, that kind of thing doesn't tend to change for us. So until we actually have politicians willing to address our particular needs, I think the outlook for many black men is, you know, what does any of this have to do with me? You know what I mean? It, 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 there's nobody really advocating for me. There's nobody really you know, engaging me to any great degree. We tend to vote Democrat to the second highest degree than any other demographic except for black women. And we suffer far more voter dis dis in disenfranchisement than any other group due to our experiences with incarceration. And yet and still, you know, those policy, even the politicians themselves, when they address the black community, don't really speak to black male needs and sometimes don't even talk to black males. So we're in a very unique position of looking at both sides from an almost detached, you know, uh, perspective, because. We haven't really felt the benefits one way or the other. And the, the, the you know, the downsides to either we, we experience on a regular basis either way. So, you know, at the end of the day, I think we're in a unique position to pose something new. And, and, and I think brothers are moving toward withdrawing their support uh, from the political process until somebody actually addresses them. The problem is we've act, we've never as a demographic actually said these are our lists of interests. Meet them. So we've you know, we've kind of told you know, the political environment that, you know, some respects we're kind of questioning whether or not we need to belong to anybody, but we still have to outline what it is we want before we can really do that effectively. And this is an attempt in that direction. 
Okay. Everyone, please uh, smash that like button. If you're not subscribed, please consider subscribing. So let's move on. So in my last uh, my last stream, I talked about um, Malcolm X's classic words about not taking the leadership, uh, not taking leadership from entertainers. Okay. <laughs> uh, not, you can't necessarily trust them. But entertainers can show us some very valuable things. And that leads me into, into my next question. So the watershed moment for a lot of people was uh, Ice Cube and the cocktails with Queens. Is that what it was? Yeah. With Queens? Yeah. yeah. So that was that was a, a, a seminal moment, again, that if you weren't, I, I doubt that they covered that on MSNBC or, or CNN, mm -hmm. but it was right right there and yes. cube is cube drew a lot of criticism for that because he mm -hmm. was called the trump supporter mm -hmm. uh he's since drawn a lot of criticism since then for that interview with tucker carlson but they but he and the and the queens they showed us something very very interesting he he brought an agenda which yeah. i think he i think dr claude anderson was one of the uh um architects yeah. of that mm -hmm. and uh claudia and lisa ray was kind of quiet but claudia and others they said well What's in that? What's in that for black women? Yeah, and yeah. that—that's when the whole thing kind of—that's when the whole debacle kind of uh, evaporated. And, and and Ice Cube said, "Well, what? Aren't you black?" Right, and it, right, it was it was right. very very cringe, right. but it was also very very educational in that they saw themselves different from yes. the group he was trying to present. So, Doctor Doctor T was 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 this agenda forming before that, or was that one of the Genesis of the the agenda. Well, we we started it in 2020 on okay. my channel, um, and you know I I think that came before. I don't remember what exact month and year that was for uh, with Ice Cube and the Cocktails with Queens. But the interesting thing about that again, that's that's another example of what I call the Black Masculinist Turn. Uh, Dr. Ronald Neal, you know, dubbed it the Ice Cube Effect. But I was looking at that moment because I saw a lot of black men for the first time get smacked in the face with the reality of we are not on the same page. You know what I mean? Those women were very clear. No, there needs to be something for women. But nobody asked the question, was there anything in it for men? Hugh left it very gender neutral. And I think he did so on purpose. But the problem is once you start to gender the dynamic, gender the discourse, the discourse, gender what he was trying to produce. We only are aware of doing so for women and girls, maybe LGBT, but not even men, not even Q really thought about what black men and boys may need in a direct way. Right. I don't even think Cube knows how to think that way. And I'm not that's not a diss on, on Cube. That goes for most of us. I didn't. Most of us don't until you actually see how it's done. And then you start thinking about all the things that you've endured that you just accept, but never really thought of in a political you know, ma manner before. You know what I mean? We just, we, if I think for many men, and this tends to be across race, we accept um, our fate. We accept the reality of the environment. And it doesn't really dawn on us to actually politicize what it is we're not happy with. We just accept it. Women don't tend to, you know, women complain. Um, and, 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 and that complaint can turn into various type of activism. You know, we get involved in activism in a very general way, but we really don't think about it in terms of ourselves and our demographics. And you'll still have men that'll, you know, suggest to you that this, you know, this act, being active on your own political behalf as a demographic of men, you know, there's something weak about it. There's something complain oriented about it, so on and so forth. But it, it really is a process, you know, to get us to understand that our political needs needs are no less valuable or, or, or important than anybody else's. If they want your vote, they should be able to cater to your needs. And you should be able to articulate what those needs are. And those are basic political premises that we all function off of, but we don't always apply. So, you know, first question to answer is what are our political needs? And you have to, you know, kind of walk into this with the belief that they are relevant and you're going to make them relevant if somebody wants your vote. Otherwise, they don't get it. And I'll tell you, the party that figures out you know, the question for me isn't really primary voter bases and who has control over them. The question for me is, you know, can, which party can galvanize people that are just completely disinterested? Those are the votes that I'm, I, I would think a political party would be most interested in. And you get the people that have been turned out of the process that don't see themselves in it, that don't see, you know, that, that anybody's listening to them. That to me can be a kind of tidal wave to tap into.
And there's a lot of different demographics that are involved in that. So in order to do that, at the very least, you got to let people know what it is you need. And, and, and I've had people come forth and they say, well, this is unrealistic. This will never happen. Maybe. But there's a lot of stuff that's happened politically in terms of policy that was unrealistic at one point or another. And we already starting to see more and more politicians. I had a politician come into my show just last week and he wrote and wrote me privately after the show, after he declared himself a politician, part of a network of other black male politicians that use the black male political agenda to determine how they're going to navigate their campaigns. That didn't happen in, in 2020. It was a process just to get here. And I'm not saying we're anywhere near the end of it, but I'm saying this is all of this is a process. So let's have the discussion. OK, well, we're going to come back to that. That's fascinating. And uh, that's yeah, that's encouraging to hear. Dr. T, I'm going to bring this data set up uh, one more time and then we're going to segue into uh, what Charles Blow uh, said. Have you at the Academy or Dr. Neal or anybody, have you have you all pondered this this data set? I'm sure this wasn't the only year when we've seen this trend, but I've I've been asking on my show how, how you can explain this. I know some people will immediately say, well, it's it's racism. But I've also wondered, does this have something to do with people not partnering anymore? So if you have more people living apart. Uh, men and women not getting along, then, yeah, you would see each home having less income than groups of people who are partnering and and putting their money together. Have you, have you ever? And so and so it's when 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 you shared that, and I I didn't see Charles Charles Blow's comments ver verbatim, oh. but it, it, it sounded like one of black men's concerns was economics. Oh, okay. Well, so Charles Blow, a journalist with New York Times, he makes this, uh, he does this short minute and a half video. I didn't know if you were going to play it or not. Oh, yeah. no, 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 no. I don't, I don't okay. have the queue up. Okay. So he makes this video where he says, well, in South Carolina, we interviewed a number of black men to get, you know, the feel of where they are politically. And he said the majority of them were interested in talking about economics. He said, but one of them was basically making the point that black men want to emulate Trump, you know, in some form or fashion. And he made the whole segment about what that one guy said. And this is this is something we've been seeing, you know, especially since the first time Trump ran, where it's really a, a shaming tactic, right, to prevent black men in particular uh, from, you know, finding interest not only in Trump, but in the Republican Party, really to be more specific, anything outside of the Democratic Party. Right. That's the goal to shame black men out of thinking beyond the Democratic Party, because the idea is that anything else out there is going to be detrimental to the community. So let's just stick with the Democrats. And I think because black men have very little to lose at this point, many of us have just reached the point where we're tired of playing that game and we're willing to entertain. I mean, hell, I'm, I remember Farrakhan in the 1980s was telling black folk, your votes should be tied to your interests and whoever the politician is that is willing to engage your politics, that's the one you deal with. Much the same we, way we saw Ice Cube do it. He didn't do it because he was trying to be down with Trump. He did. He, he basically said, I'm putting this out to both parties, I'm putting this agenda for Black America out to both parties, whichever. I want to sit down with as many as possible, but whoever answers the phone, I'm going to sit down with. The Democrats told him, we'll get around to you later. He was like, all right. Trump said, let's sit down and talk about it. So he sat down with Trump and then he became a Trump supporter, which much like misogyny is just a shaming term to be thrown about anybody that does something you don't like. He he wasn't advocating for one party over the other. He was saying, these are our political interests. Which party is willing to address it? The party we generally vote for didn't care, didn't address it at all. The other party we generally don't vote for wanted to sit down with them. Now, what came out of that can be debated back and forth, but I'll hand it to the Republicans on that front. They were willing to sit down with them. And I think that that gave black men a real indication about how our parties view us, because at the end of the day, the Democratic Party, they will entertain the black community, but it tends to be gender biased in a very subtle way that's not discussed in mainstream circles. Um, black men are not seen as the, the, you know, the, the starting point for that. So I think many black men are more primed to withdraw from any formal process and say, look, I'm willing to take my ball and go home unless somebody's interested in engaging what I want to talk about in relation to my vote. And that's an, auda an audacious statement to make 
or again, a population that suffers from severe dis voter disenfranchisement, but it's still nonetheless what black men, I think, are doing more and more. Um, and that's, you know, that's raising a lot of new questions. So, but. Okay. Well, I thought it was interesting that he would uh, kind of steer the narrative away from the interest in economics and the concern about economics when clearly that's a huge issue. Yeah, well, he he denied it and made it all about what one guy said, but he didn't even tell us what about economics these men were saying, which, which to me, even though it was just in South Carolina, I think it was a huge loss, uh, you know, for that to not be the discussion. I mean, if you got, you know, all of these men talking about economics, but you go with the one guy who makes, makes an, a strange statement about Trump, that's a loss. There's so much there that we could have teased out. I'm, I'm curious to know what exactly those men wanted to talk about. You know, that that to me would have been the primary question if journalism um, operated the way, you know, I wish it did or wish it still did, especially in terms of investigative journalism. You go with what people are doing. So if all these black men are talking about economics and nobody really knows what black men want, that's a missed opportunity. What did they want to know? What were the questions they were asking? What were the statements they were making? That's a huge loss. Mm hmm. Well, everyone, I'm going to show this again, but I'm going to ask the rhetorical question. Those men in South Carolina, were they were they looking at this? Were they thinking about this? Uh, and, and once again, how do you how do you explain that those those numbers? Okay. I think, yeah, I think marriage is, is it is a factor because whether you like it or not, this is a country where marriage is a significant component in how people as, as a community tend to function. The communities are based on families and families in many respects are based on marriage and our, and our policies are very much tied to that as well. I mean, so have a long-term girlfriend or boyfriend, get sick and go to the hospital and see who gets to come in your room and who doesn't based on who's married, right? Marriage is actually a part of how the system functions. And if you're not, and I talk about this in the book, if you're not able to even just on the basic level, get past the dating stage as a community and get to family formation, the community doesn't have long. And so I do think it's a factor. But at the same time, I don't think it's a coincidence that the one group who experienced slavery and then experienced generations of policy denial in terms of full participation. And when they did compete, like when you look at Tulsa, Oklahoma, you mm -hmm. actually saw that, you know, whites were able to take to brutality and not suffer any consequences. I mean, to this day. You have white families living in houses that or space or at least land that were owned by African-Americans at one point. So what we've seen historically is that although you have redlining, you know, you have, you, there's so many different ways that through policy we experience being pushed back, even if you're able to compete beyond and, and jump through all of those hoops and over all of those uh, hurdles at the end of the analysis. If it gets bad enough, like it did in Tulsa, where you're able to succeed despite what being pushed out and left out of competition, they can come burn your fucking house down. Excuse my language. They can come burn your house down and and take your stuff. And what? what? What do you have to rely on? So when you have that kind of history, it doesn't surprise me that you can look at 2022 data and see that this is where black families and black communities are. Uh, it's, it's not like those policies ended. I mean, they, they were just discovering Bank of America still. Uh, as of last year, we're giving out home loans on a on a completely divergent basis to black communities versus others. This stuff has never ended. Mm -hmm. We have these discussions like, you know, basically asking the question if racism ever existed. And and I think what, what tends to happen, too, is we have these kind of shaming mechanisms in place where we see the kind of data you just presented. And we just suggest, well, we haven't tried hard enough. Black folks are not operating. They're not, you know, we're not moving the right way. When you look at African-American history, there is nothing that we have not tried and still hit the same wall. But at the very end of the day, especially if you're going to talk about entrepreneurship and growth and income, if you don't have capital, if you don't have inherited wealth, if you don't have these things, you're already behind the eight ball. You're already starting far behind everybody else. Look, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm almost a full professor, right? I've been teaching for 15 years. I have colleagues that have the same degrees, they're at the same degree level as I am. We even teach in the same colleges, sometimes classrooms right next door to one another. These people have multiple cars, multiple homes. Sometimes it's because they're married. Sometimes they're single and they still have those things. And when I get into conversations with them, they start talking about what their parents did. There's some key differences. When your parents pay your way, 
through your education. So you not only graduate with no debt, but you graduate and you're actually able to get help from family for a home loan, right? Or, you, or you're actually able to get a position at your family's uh, company or whatever. These are critical differences for black and brown folk in particular. And I don't usually use both of those two, but research wise, it tends to be the case. When you're coming out with an advanced degree and you're making six figures, you're usually one of the only ones in your family doing so. Mm-hmm. And so when the family has a problem, they don't go to a bank. They don't, they come to you. You know, I think we all remember the movie Soul Food, right? With Vanessa Williams characters, mm-hmm. she's the lawyer in the family. Mm-hmm. Anytime there was a problem, they didn't go to institutions to find some type of resolution. They went to her, Terry, I think her name was in the film. They went to her. She was the bank. She was the one that was supposed to solve any kind of financial or economic um, an economic problem that popped up. That tends to be how poor families operate. So even if you do make over six figures, one of the critical differences between us and other communities that have wealth is we tend to rely on the one person in the family that has some income, not wealth necessarily, but income. You know, and we tend to over rely on them to solve the problems, whereas in other communities, they invest in those people. And then those people invest in their kids. So their kids are starting out with less debt. They're starting out, matter of fact, not with less debt. They're starting out with an investment, an inheritance. Even poor, I mean, the data came out years ago on this. Even poor uh, uh, white families without high school diploma tend to have more wealth, usually in the form of, um, you know, their parents' life insurance programs than we tend to have with college degrees, right? So we can't just deny these critical things because we don't like them. These are the reality of where we're, you know, what situations we're in. And this is why the black male political gen- agenda is open, because I want ideas from non-traditional spaces, namely the brothers that are living it, come up with the ideas based on what it is you're experiencing firsthand. And, and just, you know, before we dive into it, I, I just want to reiterate, nobody said this list is done. It's not perfect. I'm not suggesting that it doesn't have all the ideas and all the solutions. It is a space for solutions. And if you have a good idea that needs to be in it, then add it. Instead of waiting for someone to tell us what a good idea is, create it. Let's talk about it ourselves. We've lived the problem long enough, right? So we should be in a position to give ideas about what a solution could be. So anyway, just wanted to put yeah. that out. Well, the the economics piece and uh, Mr. Blow's reaction, that sounds an awful lot like, you know what? And it's clearly a serious issue. It sounds an awful lot like uh, the Tiffany Cross, just fall in line thing. Don't worry about those issues. Don't worry about that. Just fall in line and do what we say. Yeah, that's generally what pimps tell prostitutes. But yeah, you're right. Yeah. So shut up and, and fall in line and everything will work out. And it tends to work out for the people telling you to shut up. For everybody else, you know, they're still telling you that the rainwater isn't urine. But, um, you know, at some point you reach a critical critical point where people just are tired of playing the same games. And if there are no results, they're willing to withdraw and find their own solutions. And that's what you really don't want as a society. You don't want a mass, a significant enough mass of people withdrawing from this because society, all it really is, is a set of agreements. We're all agreeing to participate. I'm agreeing to follow this law that's on a piece of paper, not to kill you because you pissed me off. I'm agreeing not to come over and bash you in the head and take your stuff just because I like it. We are in an agreement as a society to not do certain things and to function in certain ways. If people become, you know, discouraged enough to withdraw from the agreement, that becomes a severe problem. And that's one of the things that's on the table. Many people are withdrawing, most particularly men are starting to severely withdraw from this process. And the last thing you want is a large enough population of men that do not feel they have a place that anyone hears what they have to say and that they can participate and be taken seriously. You get a pissed off enough population of men like that, you're going to have a problem. And that's what we're enduring now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I'm I'm waiting for one of them to talk about that openly. One of the candidates or elected officials to start talking about that, but nobody's talking about it. they're They're trying to with, with people like Richard Reeves and some others, they're, they're creating what I call the politically correct manosphere. Um, and they're, and they're somewhat tied to the Academy Brookings, you know, is one of those institutions. They're trying to find a very sanitary way to talk about what's going on with boys and men. And they're, and the method they're using, because most of them are feminists is to kind of rely on women's empathy 
women tend to vote more. And, you know, and so they're hoping that women will really allow for this conversation to happen without feeling offended and, and castigating them all, all together. So this is the kind of process you have going on. But for a lot of men who are uh, kind of feeling this withdrawal and feeling not participatory and whatnot, that may not be enough, it may not be uh, you know strong enough language, it may not be uh, forthright, full, you know, forthright enough to really explain their frustration. So, again, you might just be pissing them off more than helping. If you're going to give this ham handed, you know, washed, watered down kind of explanation of what men are going through, you know, and, and I think it does not speak to the urgency uh, that the situation calls for when you have this kind of apologetic hand wringing tone that you get from some of these guys in the politically correct manosphere. Well, you know, boys aren't graduating the same way as girls. So we really need to start thinking about them, ladies. Yeah, that's not going to work. That's not going to work. So, and again, that's one of the reasons the manosphere is offensive because they don't, there's the, the tone is not always polite. You may get cussed out and it doesn't matter who you are. You may be a founding member of the manosphere. You may have been someone that just found out about it yesterday. Anybody can get cussed out. Anybody can get challenged. Anybody can be, it's, it's the wild, wild west in some respects, but at the same time, it's a free space for dialogue that we've not seen and it does not care about your ego. Okay. I want to thank Andre for the uh, 1399 super chat. He says, uh, thanks for the conversation. Thank you, Andre. All right. Dr. Johnson, let's see. So the origins of the agenda, I think you mentioned this, you took charge of assembling all the points, but they were contributed by many members of uh, the black manosphere. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, uh, I don't know who else, uh, but is that correct? Yeah, BGS um, BGS Moore was was highly instrumental in this, and he kind of nudged me to do it because I, I I mentioned it, but I wasn't really sure if it was anything brothers would care about. At that time, much of what I heard in the manosphere was very focused around relationships and, and women. You know what I mean? So uh, you had this kind of moment where many of us were questioning, where else can this discussion go? You know what I mean? Uh, and a lot of brothers had a lot of different ideas, but the, the primary mode of what we heard in the manosphere was around women, relationships, sex, so on and so forth. And there's nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying that's what it was. So the question was, if can we take this to other spaces and would anybody care? And, you know, that was the kind of question. But BGS kind of said, well, let's do it anyway. So we, you know, we started to put the call out there. And, you know, as with most things, it was kind of slow at first. You had a small collective of brothers that were very outspoken and you had some that just kind of watched from the clouds. And I'm sure some that didn't care at all, but you had that whole combination. And as the list began to develop, we started to hear more rumblings, more rumblings. People are emailing, some are asking questions. Um, and I noticed I started getting, you know, calls and emails from, you know, guys that were, you know, um, seven figure earning, you know, bankers, you know, uh, university presidents who are, who are actually calling me directly saying, you know, I don't want my name out there necessarily, but I like this, you know, what else can we do with it? So on and so forth. And, and, you know, here's an idea I have, and that's kind of where it developed. And you'll notice if you look through it, um, there each, you get an opportunity to decide if you want your name and, you know, on your idea or not, it can be given unanimously. Or you can have your name associated with it. A lot of them are unanimous. A lot of them are unanimous. But the only question for us is, is it, is it a good idea? Now, just a quick, a quick question about that. Is that because mm -hmm. of the political blowback from your family and your coworkers or whatever? Is that, yeah, mm -hmm. same thing with, with donating? Well, it is. And it's for the same reason a lot of guys online um, will have an avatar and have a different, you know, something other than their birth name, their government name listed. Because many, will, you know, are, are concerned and rightly so that there will be blowback. I mean, we've seen that happen. You can get doxxed. You can lose your job. You can be attacked in the public eye, have your reputation destroyed. All because your relationship, you're carrying could, break up. Huh? <laughs> your relationship could break up. Yeah, absolutely. All because you have an unpopular opinion. Um, and the weird thing about unpopular opinions is they can become, you know, mainstream in 10 years and all of a sudden nobody remembers that there was this time period where you can get blackballed for having that opinion. But nevertheless, these things happen. So 
part of the, the, the aspect of the Manosphere in that regard is, you know, a lot of anonymity so that people can speak freely. Now, some people turn into trolls and they just, you know, they just ruin things simply because they can. But a lot of people, I think, were trying to protect their identity so we could have an honest conversation without having to worry about losing, you know, your entire means of supporting yourself and your family over something somebody else doesn't like. And it was a direct challenge to cancel culture, right? Because cancel culture was destroying people's lives simply on the basis of sometimes very lightweight assumptions, you know, often with no evidence. And yet, you know, you could go to jail, you, you know, court of public opinion, or just com be completely out of out of work and so on and so forth. So I think the response to that was the anonymity that the internet allows, and that has contributed to a lot of free speech. Mm -hmm. All right. So to the critics out there, you see, you know, the, you know, there, there's a, a method to the, yeah. you know, yeah. there's folks, a method behind, man. folks behind Avatar, sometimes folks have good ideas and they don't come out into the spotlight. So for yeah. all the critics out there. Yeah. All right. Let's see. Before we jump in, because that, that's the next thing we're going to do, then we'll, then we'll wrap up. You said something very, very powerful on Saturday when you when you unveiled the 18th point, and that's that uh, the importance of data. OK, mm. and that all and that pretty much everything in. This set of points is data driven and uh, data backed, so you're not just these aren't just here. People just didn't pull these out of the air, in other words. No, no. I mean, it, it, I, we try to be data driven as much as possible. But keep in mind, other than light editing on my part to make sure something is understandable, um, you know, I didn't change a lot of the verbiage. I wanted it to stay in the common tongue. I wanted it to be accessible to everyday folks. I didn't want you to have to have a master's degree and something to be able to understand what's being proposed. I wanted to keep it in a very common tongue. So I kept it in the tongue of the people that submitted those ideas. And again, they come from all over the spectrum. Some had PhDs, some didn't have a high school diploma. So I tried to keep it in the tone that it was submitted. And, and I asked people to include data. There are times where I will go out and get it. Uh, some, you know, there are probably still some points on there that could use more data that we ha that I haven't gathered yet. You'll notice the 18 point, I don't have anything there yet. Um, but, you know, we're we're trying to, you know, push for a data driven culture in regard to these ideas and these proposals. But I'm not saying each one does. I mean, so if you go through it, you'll see some that have more data than others. Some will just be a couple sentences. Others will have pages of charts and citations. So it kind of varies, um, you know, but at the end of the day, we're pushing for a culture of data driven decision making because the alternative is that it, it tends the alternative tends to be emotionally driven decision making. And we've kind of seen where that goes. Like, you know, for example, when I just mentioned cancel culture, much of that is an emotionally driven thing where people get upset and they start Xing people and often without evidence. And, and then when we find that somebody's innocent of what they're being charged for, nobody apologizes. Nobody tries to rectify what happened. They just move on to the next thing. So that that person remains steamrolled and, and, and excised from the community. We don't want to function that way. So we try to function on the basis of what available information we have. And again, we try to document it in case it's not easily available later. If it disappears and it's no longer there, we try to document what we were using as a form of logic at the time we created this idea. You know, and that's kind of the best we can do. And if there's new information that suggests that that idea is no longer needed, we'll move from there to address it. But the question is, we, you know, how many different areas, issues and needs are there? that black men haven't even thought to articulate for themselves yet that are sorely needed. You know, I had a brother reach out to me this morning, a fellow professor whose wife is using the family court system against him and turning his child against him at the same time. Now, we've heard this story a million times, but how many movies do you see about it where the, where the husband or the man in question is the protagonist? I mean, how many times have you seen your story on the screen on what your wife used the family court to do to you? I mean, it, it, we're, those stories are still not mainstream for the most part. And so, you know, until they are, until we actually can get the attention of the public and so on and so forth, we have to tell our own stories. And we have to do so unapologetically and we have to advocate for politics that protects us, protects us from this. And, and, and to the brother's case, what he was telling me, he had gone through the law. The judge actually ruled on his behalf on established dates that he should be able to visit his child. His, his baby mama or whatever you want to call her just decided one day she didn't want to abide by it. So he had to spend thousands of dollars to get his lawyer 
to pressure her to operate and abide by the agreement that was already on the books. He did so. She changed her mind at the last minute. He's out thousands of dollars, but but she did it because she could. And the question is, well, are there any types of protections that we can bring into place for men who are trying to be there for their children, so on and so forth? So these are questions that nobody else is really asking because they have a different experience. And men have to be very outspoken about our own experience. Mm -hmm. Well, I I recall you saying that uh, data and empiricism, that that's a a key component of uh, black masculinism. Uh, mm-hmm. And I and I think also data helps to uh, neutralize all of the anecdotal yes. opinions and feelings, yes. and yes. Uh, especially when when conversations break down or when someone's just saying something that's blatantly not true. That's, right. that's where data is helpful. Right, it's very yeah. helpful. Yeah. Absolutely, and and there's nothing wrong with anecdotes, but if that becomes the primary rationale for what you're doing. And I've I've observed this in the academy, in the humanities, when it comes to intersectional feminism, that's that the the invoking of intersectionality somehow became a logic unto itself that could function independent of data for many years. And there were there were opinions that came out of it. I've gone to conferences, academic conferences where people are having conversation about, say, you know, black boys and education. And they're literally talking about their sister's friend's cousin and his son. And and that's, you know, coming from scholars on stage at an academic conference discussing black boys. No charts, no data, no analysis. Just, you know, well, my friend's son acts this way and I don't think he likes school much. I've heard this from people who were supposed to be studying it. So if we could get to that point where there's no rigor and no data, then we got to be the ones to bring it, especially when many of us are actually living the outcome of these ideas working against us with no data. So we got to be able to want, be the ones to respond. And, and, and in response to Guy, um, I don't remember if I've reached out to the lead attorney, but I do know uh, Dennis Sperling has actually commented and suggested some things that are on the black male political agenda. Um, you know, but that's a good idea. I'll shoot it to the lead attorney and see if he has some thoughts as well. Okay. Or uh, feelings. The last, I don't know if I mentioned feelings. It's a, it's a good way to offset feelings. Yes. Yes. We tend to function by, by stereotype very easily, especially in regard to black men. It, it seems acceptable that we do so. And that becomes a s- serious problem. Yeah. Uh, I want to thank uh, Aquateki for the generous cash app. And Louis Conyer has a super chat here. Thank you for the $10 super chat. He says, the issue will be addressed when it has a direct impact on national security. People will get scared uh, whenever a large population of men with nothing to lose act out. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. And this is one reason we want to stay data driven as well, because when those incidents occur, people like to use stereotype to deflect and dismiss what's going on and why. And just, you know, rely on old ideas like this is too much testosterone or these guys are just inherently violent. They use these kinds of terms, but we're going to ignore, you know, the conditions that actually produce the response in question. And we want to be able to bring more to the table than that. And again, that's partly what we're doing by proposing policies that may offset future violence by actually treating these young men and men, grown men as as and elders, for that matter, as human beings. You know, that's kind of the idea behind it. Okay. So everyone, uh, there was a reason I was reading that book, uh, Men Without Work by Nicholas Eberstadt uh, about half a year ago. Uh, mm-hmm. So this is, this is systemic. There's, uh, and, and he, he did say that, that a, a large chunk of the unworking men are from the black community in that book. So there's something happening that mm-hmm. the question is who has the guts in our political class to talk about it Yeah, out loud. Okay. Yeah. Let's see. So, yeah. So let's walk through. um, Let's walk through the points. Mm -hmm. All right. So everyone, we're going to walk through the points. The the, I'm going to put the link beneath the stream. So we're not going to go through each one with a fine tooth comb. Uh, But uh, Dr. Johnson, if there's something that that uh, stands out to you that you want to spend more time on, do that. Anyone in the chat, if there's if you have, you know, comments, I'll, I'll try to catch those as well. But this is now the 18 point uh, black male political uh, agenda. 
Let me see if I can blow that up a little bit. Okay, so again, I'm not, I'm not going to go over all these uh, with a fine tooth comb. And uh, these are all outlined in Dr. Johnson's book as well, well, except for point eight eighteen, um, which was just uh, jumped on the list. So uh, family court reform, mm -hmm. education. That one stands out to me because of the, the reading level of black boys. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Johnson, I have a question about that. So I, I've seen multiple data sets. Are, are the girls doing much better or is it that the boy the boys aren't are doing just that bad and no one oh, no one's paying attention it's not well the girls are not exactly you know blowing the roof off of it but they're they're a little more predictable and they're graduating more they're graduating uh, the boys more. are graduating more so in terms of geds than actual uh diplomas so you see the difference there um but when it comes to boys i think by the time we're talking eighth grade there's about, a, you know, about 10 percent of boys are at reading level. And that, that applies to math and science as well. Um, and 10 to 12 percent in that regard by the eighth grade, which is extremely low. The girls are doing better than that. But you also got to figure you're talking about an environment where, you know, especially in elementary school, over 90 percent of the teachers are female. So we're going to act like these things have no connection. Right. That the teacher's gender identification and the impact that has on students doesn't have any connection. When there is data to suggest that boys do actually tend to do better under male teachers, girls tend to do better under female teachers. And, you know, there is some affirmation going on. But we, you know, in this kind of gender moment where we act like there is no, you know, correlation, you know, we just kind of dismiss the boys without explaining why. Excuse okay. Me. Everyone, uh, where'd it go? And oh, you'll notice. everybody, listen, listen, listen to Toya. Hit the like button if you haven't. <laughs> I'd appreciate that. Go ahead. Shout out to, Toya. Shout out to Donnie. Yep. Uh, shout out to Andre. A lot of brothers. Ray Knowles, Lewis. A lot of brothers. Ray Knowles. Um, Ray Knowles. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, you'll notice, you'll notice that uh, family court reform has the most sub points. It has 17 sub points. That, that should tell you. I mean, if you look at criminal law reform has 12. So this kind of, you know, in a, it kind of lets you know the, you know, the everyday brother, it, it, it kind of shows you what they're dealing with more often than not. I mean, we can talk about brothers being dealing with cops, being dealing with incarceration, but, you know, they're dealing with something a little more close to home that's impacting them a little more than that. And that's not part of the national discussion on what's going on with uh, black boys and men. And I think it should be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. You, you've done a lot a lot of stories on your channel about uh, black boys uh, 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 dying gruesome deaths, uh, you know, at the hands of, uh, if I recall, when, when it's a single parent uh, situation and there's no father. Uh, so there, there, are, there are some serious ramifications for that. Or dealing with grape. Yeah. Yeah. Grape. Okay. So, and this relates back to the example you just you just talked about. So, family court reform, education, uh, affirmative action for Black men, uh, targeted homelessness programs. So, men make up the majority of the homeless population, right? Okay. And Black men disproportionately so in major just, urban centers. Yeah, disproportionately so. Targeted unemployment programs. Um, criminal law and law enforcement. There are 12 sub points there. I think Officer Faulkner might have contributed something to that. I believe so. <laughs> this is an interesting one. Intimate partner violence slash homicide policy reform. Yeah. And and I, this has a lot to do with perception because you you wouldn't think that a woman could inflict violence and damage upon a man because we're we're tend to be we tend to be bigger and stronger but i think well, public, public perception is she's a you know a, a, a rose and she can't do anything and yes he'll do something to her but she won't do anything to him yeah yeah and that bias has has directly impacted you know everyday men i mean you you have situations where the police can show up he actually has marks on him but he can be the one to go to jail he can be the one that actually called the police because he was being abused and be the one to go to jail 
because of the assumptions about gender, uh, and they can be severe in terms of their impact. So, you know, and so that's one of those sections where you see there's a lot of data posted because uh, I think we're in an era where women have enjoyed several decades of policy that operate on their behalf. And although a lot of it is written in gender neutral language, the application of those policies in regard to punishment, sentencing, or even, you know, arrest tend to function based on a very old paradigm that women can do no harm. But that didn't even work even at the beginning. I mean, if you look at Erin Pizzi's work, where she talked about, you know, the earliest shelters for women uh, who were being abused and battered, she, she'll she tell you, she you know, she's done interviews on YouTube where she talked about the women that came in when they interviewed those women, you know, and asked about violence. The women had really turned out to be just as violent as the men they were leaving, right? It, it wasn't, uh, you know, violence from one side. That's the, that's the kind of, you know, uh, Duluth model uh, framework that many of us have been, you know, raised in that, that was debunked by a number of people, including Dr. Tommy Curry. But it, at the end of the day, Pizzi found out those women were just as violent and then went to tell her own story where her mother and father were both violent, right? And so we, we don't talk about bi-directional violence and intimate partner violence. We just think of it in terms of one way. And there's been generations of programming to complement that. Lifetime movies. I mean, I grew up in the 70s and the 80s. <laughs> Where when you when you saw abuse on the screen, it was always, you know, a, a male abuse. And, and matter of fact, we've seen a lot of female violence even in media. We just don't categorize it as violent. If you think about how many shows and movies you've seen where a woman is slapping somebody, hitting somebody, throwing something at somebody, most particularly men, it's considered, you know, part of the story. If he hits her, it's considered abuse. Yeah. And we have this very kind of uh, staggered view of what constitutes violence and what isn't, right? Um, it was just a, a, one of many situations, but a, a situation I posted on, on Facebook recently where um, a woman you know, killed her partner because she suspected he was cheating. And when you look at the comment sections, the women were saying, basically it's justified that she suspected he was cheating. Not that he was, but that she suspected it. Her actions were therefore justified. But even if he was cheating, that's not a death penalty sin. That's just somebody that that's a relationship you might need to leave. But that doesn't deserve the death penalty. But if a man is upset that his woman is cheating and, and, and physically violates her or commits homicide, there's never a justification to support that. So we have we tend to have this one sided view. And when women do these extreme things, the response from other women in the comment section is generally what did he do to provoke it? Or what was her background that made her so damaged? But when men do it, that's just their nature. You know, we really have to get past that. Yeah. Well, in a um, in in a joking way, whenever there's a breakup, it's also, well, what did you do? You know, as as a man, what did you do to to cause that? So, yeah. well, I'll, I'll, we think a lot about our strength over women, but what happens when she throws boiled uh, sugar water on you while you're asleep? What happens if she poisons your food? Uh, yeah. yeah, there was a case in Europe uh, where a wife basically boiled a big vat of sugar water and poured it on her elderly husband, and it literally pulled the skin off of his body, right? Yeah. And then she went next door and told the, the neighbors what she did, right? Yeah. You know, what happens if someone, she could be 4'11 and weigh 100 pounds. What happens if she pulls a gun on you? I mean, we think that this strength thing is the difference between men and women, and it is significant in many instances, but it has nothing to do with intimate partner violence in that regard. Women tend to use weapons to a greater degree than men. Men tend to use their own hands. Um, you know, but other than that, violence can go either way and you can lose your life either way. You yeah. know, it's just not a matter of who's stronger. There's a lot of different things that can equalize that playing field. Uh, isn't the story that uh, Al Green had, uh, what does his wife put on him? Hot grits or something? Yep. yep. Hot grits. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. A lot well, of things that people can do to you, you know, that have nothing to do with strength. Well, you know, I was going to say, Dr. Johnson, you know, the poster, the poster child for uh, portraying uh, an abuse, abusive black man is uh, the a color purple. The color oh, yeah. purple. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yes. Which I've done a couple of reviews on on my channel. Absolutely. That yeah. is become the poster. That's become the face of it in black America. And even as unrealistic as a lot of that is people still to this day, believe it to be true. Mm -hmm. 
frame that. I mean, it really, black men became Mr. They became Danny Glover's Mr. Um, and I watched it happen in the 80s. You know, black men as a whole demographic became Mr. in the imaginations of many and most, yep. most particularly many black women. And, um, you know, how unrealistic it was, how unrelated to the data it was, you know, because if you look at Tommy Curry's work in The Man Not, he actually points out in the 80s and different periods of time, women were actually abusing men to a greater degree than men were abusing women in the black community. But you'll never know that if we're rolling with these mythologies that come out of film and media like Mr. from Color Purple. But that's been that's become so popular. It's been considered a truth, even though it isn't. Mm hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. OK. Michael Anthony asks, uh, is there a PDF version of the document? No, I, I saw um, a Compassionate uh, uh, and Callous on YouTube is working on something like that. I got to talk to him to find out more what he's doing. But the document is freely accessible. You can print it out yourself. You can copy and paste it. It's right there. It, it, it's, you know, and if you can't find the link for any reason, just put 18 point political, you know, blackmail political agenda in Google. And this is what will come up. This is the only blackmail political agenda I've ever seen in my lifetime. Now, maybe there's been something new. Maybe there's something in the past I haven't seen before. I'm willing to be corrected, but I've never seen one in my lifetime. So you put that in Google and you'll you'll find it readily. You can put in blackmail political agenda and you'll find it. You know, so it's freely accessible. You can print it. You can copy paste it. You can do what you want. It's right there. And you can even respond to it. Because it's on WordPress, you can you can write comments below it uh, as long as I guess you have a, you know, some kind of a account. I forget what it's called. But yeah, anyway, it's yep. accessible, but it, I don't have it in PD format that I'm, you know, that I've sent out or anything of that nature. Well, everyone, I just put the link here if you want to go to it and save it in your browser. OK, uh, I'm going to read two more of these. Let's see. African. Uh, Repat says a recent case of a woman stabbed a man 108 times and got two years probation. Yep. Yep. And Absolutely. then, of course, Monique, she just uh, paid Club Shay Shay a visit. Monique said in her interview with Shannon Sharp, she had mutual combat with her husband, met an older woman who also said her relationship was mutual combat. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, that, that tends to be the case more often than not when it comes to intimate partner violence. It's what, that's what we refer to as bi-directional. Absolutely. But we don't, but in the mainstream, they eliminate that. And again, they just make it about men violating women. It's far more complex and nuanced. And as a matter of fact, one of the reasons we have black male studies is what we found is that you actually have to create the terminology and the vocabulary to explain other experiences. So if you take grape, for example, what they found when the FBI created the term is that up until for almost a hundred years, the the definition of grape was simply the violation of a woman's body, and it was a more kind of slightly more technical explanation. But the definition included the violation of a woman's body. Well, from there, you could say ninety nine percent of grape incidents were men violating women because that was the very definition. But what ended up happening is they had scores of cases that were unclassified. And it wasn't until 2012 where the FBI changed the definition to include to actually remove women's body from it and deal more with penetration and violation. And then they found once they changed the definition, they had hundreds of thousands of cases of males that had experienced that even from women. If you talk about made to penetrate and other forms of violation, but we didn't have that terminology prior to that. So the terminology becomes important in terms of actually classifying it. And what they ultimately found is that men and women commit the same acts, but sometimes in different ways. And we only paid attention to the ways men committed it. And we didn't imagine that women had their own methods. So it was very one-sided. But once we created those categories, it explained all of these unclassified cases. And you saw that men and women can both be extremely toxic and aggressive, but sometimes in slightly different ways. And those ways don't become visible until you create the terminology to explain it. Okay. All right. Uh, number eight is health targeted treatment and recognition for heart disease, cancer, suicide, and HIV. Uh, let's see campaigning. Yeah. As a, a biomedical scientist, I remember reading that and some, a lot of the stats show that men are, um, afflicted by many of these disease states, black men 
at a much higher rate than people think about. I'm, I'm curious, you know, coming at it from your training, uh, do you remember how it impacted you to see that black males actually are number one on those lists? You know, and, and many times they, they're not explained. They're not able to explain why. How did that impact you coming into this research when you first ran into it? Well, let's see. Heart disease. When I think about heart disease, I think about stress. Mm -hmm. I think about I think about uh, adverse conditions. I think about an extremely uh, difficult, extremely difficult living circumstances. Um, cancer, cancer. Yeah, I, I, I don't know the, the cancer statistics, but suicide, I mean, some of the things that we know that, that Black men go through uh, in, in terms of their, their lives, that, that one stood out to me. I just, I, I think that these statistics and these trends, they, they don't get enough um, spotlight. Well, the, the HIV one tends to impact more men who have sex with other men, but you still find at least up to a few years ago, black males uh, suffering more in regard to um, acquiring, you know, um, HIV slash AIDS. But the cancer thing, obviously, there's many different types of cancer. But yes. if you look at, you know, the prostate cancer, um, you know, you, you, you find that black men tend to have not high number. And I still have some charts I can I can extend to you, if, you know, but at least up to a few years ago. Um, the rates of cancer for men and, and black men were significantly higher than for women. And yet there's a lot of people that don't know it. And there's a lot, a lot of people in the medical community that still can't explain it. But this is one of the reasons we included it here, because we're, we're saying there needs to be targeted treatment. And that's why you notice the key word after that and recognition, because most people don't know. And, you know, and, and a lot of it is still unexplained, but, you know, Black men are suffering severely from these things and they're just kind of being swept under the rug and ignored. Yeah. Okay. Number nine, uh, targeted small business support. So economics. All right. Number 10 is social security and life insurance, family support, economics, uh, paternity leave, paternity leave, mm -hmm. reverse Voter disenfranchisement. That's an interesting one. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Number 13, black male specific reparations for the transatlantic slave trade through the 21st century and hyper incarceration. Yeah. Uh, we make the case that, you know, um, really it's not until the early 1800s that you see the United States focusing on bringing women in in significant numbers. Uh, so, you know, in the 1600s onward, it was mostly a focus on men. It's not to say women weren't here at all, but it is to say the majority of those, uh, you know, enslaved were men because the, the, the European model and, and the American model for that matter is you worked a man to death and you replaced him. Once it became clear, and this is something Dr. Claude Anderson talks about, once it became, you know, illegal to transport uh, people forcibly uh, across the, you know, the Atlantic Ocean, you know, for the purpose of enslavement, um, several states in the union asked for an additional amount of time to acquire enough females so that they could breed their own enslaved populations. So this is where you, you know, you bring in women right up to about 1810. And that's about 50 years before, the, you know, the end of the Civil War. So you're talking about a fairly late period where women are brought in. And, and so we hear about reparations on, you know, a fairly gender neutral terms. But again, I'm like, if the first couple hundred years of enslavement is primarily fixed on, fixated on black men, why haven't we asked the question about reparations specific to those men that were taken, brutalized and worked to death? And keep in mind, this continued all the way up through Reconstruction, where black men, particularly in the South, were appropriated forcibly against their will through trumped up charges often to work to death and railroads and, 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 you know, coal mines, so on and so forth. They, many of them were just thrown into pits and not even, you know, having marked graves where they, you know, they just worked to, to death and died at a young age from being overworked. This, this hasn't been addressed in any capacity. So we thought it important to include. 
Okay. Wow. Let's see. 14. The United Nations, we charge the U.S. with the genocide of the black male. Okay. You notice it comes right after the one, you know, based on what I just got through explaining, you can understand the rationale behind that. But if you actually look at how the United Nations defines genocide, you'll see why we make the point. So read through, you know, people can read through that and see what the logic is for that. But, you know, that's where it comes from. Okay. Now, number 15, I'm not a master at reading Roman numerals. Is that title, title seven? Title seven. Okay. In my mind, I keep thinking title nine. You want to <laughs> you want to unpack this one? Title seven. Um. Let, let me see here. Uh, I don't know if you want to you want to click on it. Sure. Do it the easiest way, and and you can just hit the back button, and it'll take you right back to this list. Um. So okay. you see it there. Um. That's the Civil Rights Act of 1964. By removing the addition of sex to the oh, act, I notice okay. title nine already addresses sex, but they added it to the title seven. Uh, which was really earmarked for African-Americans, right? For black folk. Um, they, but when they added sex to it, it basically redirected attention and resources to women in an area that was supposed to be about race in response to the civil rights movement. You know, so between Title VII and Title IX, gender is kind of well represented, um, you know. Um, but, you know, you can see the the explanation there. And we try to do that, you know, to provide some background to explain why this is on there. So we try to, you know, give some explanation to it. But as it says, by removing the addition of sex to the act, as it has been detrimental to black males and by extension, black families, the removal of sex from Title VII would be more in line with the spirit of the act as originally proposed in 1964 and would position both black men and women as the rightful recipients of affirmative action resources and entitlements. Now, we keep in mind here that it, it, the same kind of thing ended up happening later with the logic of intersectionality, what you ended up having is these categories for, you know, identity and under affirmative action, as well as under um, intersectionality, what these corporations are in, they're still doing it now with DEI policies. You know, we've been hearing about this with Disney and other corporations. What they do is they kind of give certain attention to key demographics and, and, and identity, right? You know, so even in the seventies and eighties, corporations, who were looking to meet the uh, Title VII requirements would look at Black women as a twofer, right? Because they were both women and they were both Black. So mm -hmm. this meant that first, you know, it, it, this was supposed to, affirmative action was supposed to be earmarked for Black men in many respects. It, it immediately switched to white women once white women define themselves as minorities, right? So they, they, they redefine themselves as a minority. They take the lion's share of affirmative action resources. But then after them are black women who are identified as both categories. So now you had corporations that were hiring white women and then they'd bring in a number of black women that satisfied two categories. And then after that, third on the list, you might get a black male or two. And this is, again, something uh, Kevin Samuels and I talked about in the interview I did with him. Why you had corporations with so few black men. It came out of this legacy with Title VII of prioritizing white women and then prioritizing black women who were both who met both categories. And so black men found themselves at the back of the bus in regard to resources that were supposed to heavily identify them and target them for resources and employment. Okay. You, you know, what's, what's funny is, is uh, with this being black history month, this is a little known secret mm -hmm. of the civil rights bill. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, because when it's, when it's taught to us, it's always, you know, Martin Luther King, I have a dream and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. voting rights. They always emphasize the voting rights, voting rights. We got voting rights, but this is never talked about. Right. The That's double really minority true. status has been a problem. And, it, and it's reared its head again um, in the current DEI moment. They still kind of use the same similar logic where you'll tend to see more black women, more L black LGBT being hired into certain positions. Um, but. You know, heterosexual black males tend to fall at the bottom of that list. What's up, Artisan? Shout out to you. Shout out to Compassionate. Um, you know, anybody I haven't mentioned, there's no dis disrespect intended. we just in the flow of the conversation, but shout yeah, out to you. Focusing on this agenda here. All right. And then can... can cannabis, he... and, cannabis NJ. Okay, Cannabis NJ. All right, all right. Um, all right. So that's number 15, uh, data disaggregation. 
Okay. Uh, basically, uh, basically, and and I, you know, if you're a researcher and you're and you're looking at the stats, like the one you presented earlier, right, on mm-hmm. on, on families and income, one of the things we find is that a lot of the time that data is not disaggregated for both race and gender. They tend to be disaggregated at best for one or the other. So you'll see categories for the whole community, like you saw in the charts you you you, the, you presented, and then you'll see some that'll say, okay, and this is the gender part where you see male versus female or whatever. But you know, sometimes it, it there's not enough, I should say, where they disaggregate the data by race and gender, so we can actually see what applies to black men, what applies to black women, and so on and so forth. And one of the things we the reason that came about is because over the years, looking at this data, a lot of the issues that we call black issues, I tended to find had varying degrees of difference in terms of how black men and women experience them, right? And and if you don't have that information, we just think of it as a black problem. But there are some issues that are uniquely black male that need attention, and it's not enough to just say this is a black issue, uh, especially if those resources don't go to the demographic that suffers the most. So it's like if you take if you take breast cancer, something that only I think two to four percent of black men suffer from, and you say this is just a black issue, that's not specific enough. That tends to be a black women's issue. And those resources should be directed appropriately to deal with that because women are overwhelmingly suffering from those issues. But we found that a lot of the issues over the years that were termed black issues, black men tended to suffer from, from them to a greater degree, and yet there's no mention of that. As a matter of fact, the only time there's mention of particular suffering is if it applied to everyone but black men, most particularly women, LGBT, sometimes children. But we have this hesitance to actually say black men, you know, let alone heterosexual black men, as if those groups. And I think part of that is because when you look at the, the logic of intersectionality, the idea is that, you know, and I think it's gotten watered down more than black feminists initially even meant it to stand for. But uh, black men become synonymous with white men. In certain circles. So the idea is because you're heterosexual, you have a penis, you're therefore a patriarch, an oppressor, and you're privileged. Right? Early intersectionality put, posed the argument that the only thing that separated black men and women were black men were male and therefore enjoyed privileges that meant that their oppression wasn't as bad. But when you actually looked at the data, you found that they were actually hyper targeted because they were male, not privileged because of it. And so we're basically saying, that if, you know, with data disaggregation, it would help us to best identify what areas are targeted uh, to different demographics, most particularly black men, so we could better, you know, better assess um, who needs what. But as long as it stays generic, uh, we tend to not acknowledge black male suffering. Okay. All right. And I think, I think uh, blackdemographics.com, they have some interesting data sets over there. They do, yeah. In in this income space and who's earning what and how how many people are you know six figure earners and I think if I if I recall that data correctly, below below a certain threshold, the women make more, mm-hmm. but in the in the high earning in the high earning sets, the men in, on average make more money. But I yeah. won't. I won't try it's to unpack a, that right now. It's a double-sided blade. I mean, there are more men. Um, this is post uh, Generation X too. There are more men at the six-figure level. But what I think a lot of people ignore, and even some of us in YouTube, in our in our exuberance to highlight how well some of us are doing, we don't want to look at the other side of that chart. When you start talking about those who are not employed, when you start talking about those uh, you know who are homeless, those who. When you start looking at those numbers, black men are severely suffering. So this is why I always say we're doing better and worse despite not having any targeted support. Um, You know, black women get targeted support and they they tend to congregate in the middle better than we do in terms of, you know, somewhat of a stable economy, stable income. They're not doing as well as white women, but they tend to be employed more often. They tend to have some kind of stable income to a greater degree. We make more on the extreme ends, but we tend to suffer more on the extreme end as well. Um, it, it, I'm curious to see what's going on economically as black women are the leading group of evictions um, and, you know, are losing jobs because, it's, you know, there's data to come, that's come out to suggest that, you know, um, AI is replacing more female, more, more women's jobs than men's. So I'm curious to see if any of that data has changed. But traditionally, it's been such that... Um, 
you know, they've been able to live, a, you know, a more secure life in the middle and men tend to suffer at the extremes. Um, and there are more of us in the negative part of the extremes in terms of poverty and unemployment than there are those of us that are making hundreds of thousands and making more than black women. I think that number is down to like 10,000 something. It's a small number um, in terms of the, the number of men making six figures versus women. But when it comes to poverty, we are well overrepresented and that's the side of it. Nobody wants to talk about, including some of us sometimes. Wow. Okay. Uh, two more. So a black, black men's rights to self-defense is this against law enforcement or against, uh, significant others or no, actually it has to do with the right to, uh, to bear arms. To bear the, arms. The, the brother that submitted that is actually the vice president of, um, the African American gun association. And so he has some interesting points to, to make as far as, uh, our rights to self-defense, because you can imagine, and you've seen stories about black men who legally owned guns and were still shot down and mistreated and so on and so forth. So um, he's talking about gun control in regard to that and um, makes an excellent point there to, to look through. Um, so he's talking about providing grant money um, for firearms training uh, and so on and so forth. So he goes into some detail about that. Um, but yeah. Okay. And then uh, the final and newest point is false accusation offender registry. Yeah. How did, how did this one come about? Actually, the same brother that came up with the uh, the right to self-defense submitted this one as well. And then BGS embellished on it a little bit and added another component. And it kind of went from there. And so far, a lot of the men, uh, some, some of whom are not even affiliated with the channel, who've never watched my show. Uh, some of them aren't even black. As soon as they saw those, 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 four, those four words, <laughs> false accusation offender registry, it was like ding, ding, ding. A lot, a lot of them didn't even read it. As soon as they saw the terms, they were like, that makes perfect sense. That makes perfect sense. Because we're in an era now where, especially post me or, you know, me too, in the me too era, we're in this era where you can be falsely accused. The person doesn't have to provide evidence. Their face and name don't have to be made public. You have men that have been dead for decades who are being accused of having committed certain crimes. And sometimes their estate is sued. But again, no evidence. And no repercussions it, it, it's, it's along, alongside not having your name or face exposed to the public. Um, you know, it, 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 when you are actually, you know, it's determined that this is a false accusation. There's really very little punishment. Now, there are laws on the books to punish people for such things, but they're not often applied. So a lot of these people who do this are able to walk away scot free. So they, you know, so there's no incentive to provide evidence and operate a certain way in good faith. Because there's no punishment if you abuse that law. And if you, you know, if you're able to get something out of it, you got something out of it. So it, it really, you know, we're, we're, we're creating an environment where people can make accusations scot-free, no punishment, no, no kind of checks and balances. And they either get something out of it or they walk away with what they came into it with. Right. But we want to provide some disincentives for, for doing that. And so the idea is if you have been deemed and it's documented that you falsely accuse somebody of something that your name should be put in this registry that's accessible not only to the public, but also to corporations or institutions in regard to jobs. Now, and this, this affects mom and pop businesses as well as corporations, as well as individuals. I mean, so I come to you, you know, Dr. Dunbar, and I say, okay, well, if you're dating a woman and you look her up and you find that her name's on the registry and you can identify what type of false charge she's initiated, would that make you think twice about going further with her? Um, or if you owned a small business and you found that she had levied false accusations against the last business she worked for or the last three that she worked for, would that give you pause about hiring her? Well, what if you're Coca-Cola, you know, would that be the case as well? You know, we're saying, you know, you know, if you're not going to do jail time, you know, you should, you, you should at least be publicly, uh, you know, known as far as your past behavior. And that way, if you if you are going to accuse something of some somebody something from somebody, you should be able to have evidence. You should be able to prove your your case. And if you don't have it, you know you don't have it, and that's unfortunate. If especially if this, what happened to you is true, but these are the realities we got to live with. You got to be able to provide evidence, and most of us have to live under that. And if you're going to remove that and then make it to where nobody has to you know accept any responsibility for what they put forth, you got a lot of people, many of whom tend to be men 
uh, that will find themselves vulnerable to this. And this is what we've seen in this cancel culture Me Too moment. A lot of men have uh, have suffered under this. Now, we tend to hear about celebrities and athletes. Those are, you know, the news gravitates to that. What we don't talk enough about is everyday men. The guy who got demoted or fired from his job and he's making 35000 a year, that doesn't make the newspaper. The, you know, the woman, the woman that he works with that went to, uh, you know, human resources and said that he did something with no evidence and the job just got rid of him. We're seeing this in, a, in the academy with students where the accusations may be made and there's documented cases where women basically lied because they just felt ashamed of what happened or because he didn't want to date her. He just wanted to have sex with her. And in her frustration, accused him of rape in response because she was angry. And the university's response is to, you know, create a committee. Often they'll they'll kick him out of school and the police are not involved in, the, in any kind of investigation. It strictly happens on campus and they tend to lean toward whatever said. There are some law, lawsuits coming out where some of these male students are responding because they're able to prove that they're innocent. And, and, and the university sometimes was provided this information and will still ignore it. But we're saying, OK, those kind of people who are making those kind of documented false accusations need to be held accountable. And at the very least, they need to be made public so people can choose whether or not to continue to operate with them or not. You know. So that's what that's yeah. about. Yeah, false accusations are very, very dangerous. And you guys mentioned on Saturday that even if even if the man is found uh, innocent, the damage has already been done. It's already done. It's already done. And they say that now they're saying that only about 10 percent at the most of cases are a result of false accusations, which to me is interesting because that means that you have to actually prove that it's a false accusation. We don't always find evidence of that. You know, some people have texts, some people have verifiable video, things of that nature. But if you don't have evidence, that doesn't mean it's not a false accusation. But they say up to 10 percent have been proven to be false. And when you think about that against the American public, we're talking over more than over 20 million people. So this is something that can still impact you. Um, but you're absolutely right. The accusations enough, especially for black men who have a legacy of stereotype in regard to us being, you know, hypersexual, violent, so on and so forth. When you come out of that particular stereotype legacy, we are particularly vulnerable to these kind of accusations. And, and, and so I've, I've, I've been in counsel with men for the last 20 years who've had these experiences and have lost jobs, have lost, uh, been kicked out of schools, have lost opportunities strictly on the basis of somebody who was angry at them and was able to, you know, basically destroy their reputation with a word, you know. And so, uh, yeah, that's why we're pushing for some kind of acknowledgement that these people exist that they exploit uh, the goodwill of the public and they exploit um, the law to operate strictly on whatever they feel like in a given moment, regardless of the impact it has on the person in question. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, someone mentioned the, uh, the brick lady. Yep. Uh, it, it's good that what's happening to her is happening to her because I mean, she, she got money out of it, but she also yeah. caused a, a big, hysteria and you know yes. the men the men weren't protecting me and the men didn't do this and the men yes. just stood around so she yeah. just completely it, demonized yeah you know uh black men and she she exploited the public's goodwill right the idea that women are inherently innocent and nonviolent what did she say she said a man hit me with a brick because I wouldn't give him my phone number and there were all kinds of think pieces and, and social media posts where people were saying, yes, this is what men do and men need to stop, so on and so forth. People believed her simply because she said it. And she started her video blaming a group of men standing around that didn't even know what the hell she was talking about. Right. And then when it came out that she was dishonest, you still have some of those people refusing to accept that she lied. Right. So, you know, this is the reality we're in. And if we're going to be in this reality, there needs to be checks and balances. And people like her should be documented. And I don't mean just in public media and social media, because in 10 years, if she changes her name and in 10 years, she's just out operating. People may forget. But if you're part of a registry where that information is updated, you got to deal with the repercussions of your behavior. I mean, this is aren't, aren't prison, aren't ex-cons who paid their time still punished in the public's imagination for past crimes, regardless of the time served? Places won't hire them. They have to operate in certain ways to function. I seem, nobody seems to have a problem with that 
especially in regard to those who, who've had to do time, especially when they're men, especially when they're black men. But when we start talking about holding people accountable, accountable for false, falsely accusing folks of things they didn't do, now all of a sudden we got to we got to give them, you know, space to be forgotten. No, I don't think that works. Yeah. yeah. OK, Dr. T, two more. Uh, I, I, you already mentioned this. Has anyone from the political sector reached out to you about the agenda? And I think you said yes. Yeah, there have been a couple. Um, and then we've seen some states that are starting to enact policies that are directly in line with the things we're talking about. Texas, Tennessee, um, Maryland. Um, you know, there's been a number of states and, and key politicians. It's still at the beginning stages, but we're starting to see more of it. I don't I don't have control over these people. I just want to be clear. I'm not telling them what to do. These are mostly male politicians that have reached out to say, you know, uh, we, we've read through the agenda. There's a lot of relevant points here that we want to move on and we're interested in. And they basically just kind of declaring themselves um, to say, hey, we're here, you know. So, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to see what comes next. Um, I'm no more political than the next guy. I didn't I don't have a political science degree. I'm not I'm not running for office. You know, I don't have a, a pocket full, full of money in regard to, you know, this that I'm sitting on top of and whatever. This is purely an organic grassroots movement that is is taking each step to go higher as we come to it. So if you guys have ideas on what could be happen, happening differently, what we could do you know, better, I'm all for it as long as it's extended in good faith and it's not rooted in you know any kind of trolling. But this is not something that I purposely came up with because this is my line of work and I'm I'm in politics and I know what to do. No, this came up out of necessity. And every step we take is is something we're coming to slowly but surely. So I'm not I'm not suggesting I have all the answers. I didn't write the list. I just asked brothers to contribute to it. And I'm telling people to review it, share it, talk about it, cite it, reference it, and add ideas to it. Well, I think it's powerful that those individuals from the political sector, whoever they are, that they took notice. I mean, as, as I said earlier, uh, the, the sector, the space, whatever you want to call it, gets a bad mm -hmm. rap. BGS himself sometimes gets a bad rap. And one of the things he said quite a bit is, you have, to, you have to figure out ways to impact policy. Yeah. And this has started doing that. It's, it's, it's caught the eyes of individuals who are in shaping policy. Yeah. It, it, and those are the ones that came forward. Um, and this is, this goes back to something you said at the beginning of the show in terms of the reputation of the manosphere, you got a lot of people in public positions that don't want to be publicly associated. I mean, hell, you still have the majority of brothers in the manosphere that, that still identify um, using avatars and, you know what I mean, and, and concealing their anonymity. So, you know, it, if that's the case for the people in it, why would we think politicians would be any different? Right? They have to be very strategic if they're going to engage any of this on how they come forward and what they're associated with. But my point simply is um, the way we wrote this agenda, it's not it's it's open. You know what I mean? And so you can you can you can take pieces of it and do what you can with it. And, you know, if you have a politician that says, look, I'm running on this platform and I'm willing to take point, you know, 18 or point seven from this agenda and put put it forth. Well, OK, now you have my attention. Now you have our attention. Right. And you want you obviously doing this in exchange for votes. So now we can actually have a conversation. You know what I mean? But if we're if we're just going to withdraw from voting or we're going to just jump to the other party and vote, but we're not clear about what our frustrations are. I mean, you know, I don't, I don't know how productive that is in the long run. I mean, at some point people want to know what we think, what we have to say and, um, and go from there. Uh, the guy who reached out to me, his name is Michael Churchill and you can kind of look him up and look into uh, what his background is, but he identified with some elements of the uh, agenda and said he was very interested in pursuing it. Uh, I don't know a lot about him. I didn't know him beforehand. Um, but, you know, again, this is happening on such a grassroot level. Uh, let's let it build up. And let's support it as we see it. And if you have politicians who are operating in good faith, then let's take that seriously and uh, and go from there. Okay. Compassionate and Callous says, uh, shout out to you, Doc. You going down 
in uh, black history for your work. Yeah, I, I agree. And as good man, piggybacking off of what you just said, yeah, I think it's yeah, the politicians who are actually speaking to what's going on and not pandering and virtue signaling and and uh, engaging in theater, I think those are the ones I'll be looking at. I'll, mm-hmm. be, I'll be trying to take notice of who's actually talking to what's going on as opposed to the usual yeah. mumbo jumbo. Oh, yeah. I'm looking forward to the to the day where you actually do have an interview of sorts with a major political figure and they ask black men, what do you want? And somebody actually says, well, if you refer to the black male political agenda, this is what we're interested in. It, the more people know about it, the more I think it changes the political discussion. But because it's grassroots, it's going to be a slower process coming from the ground. The difference, though, is we're able to do this in an era where we have access to Internet and social media, which allows for people to do in record time. Like if you look at something like um, Marcus Garvey, right, back in the day, Garvey was able to build up an organization that was international in focus and had over a million people in it. That was inconceivable at that time. But now with Internet, you can do that kind of thing pretty quickly. You can actually have an international move. I mean, hell, my channel only has 38,000 subscribers, but I have brothers and people who reach out to me from all over the world, right? Far more than who actually subscribe. So this is something that can be more readily done in this era, thanks to technology. And I think we should take advantage of it. Okay. I want to thank uh, Passport OG. I don't know what this currency is, but uh, Mm -hmm. it's, it's yellow. So that's probably equivalent to 10 American dollars. She says the beauty of the agenda is that it's a blueprint to address black male voters. Good trouble. That's the second time you said good trouble. I actually have a John <laughs> Lewis bobblehead back there somewhere. <laughs> I got yeah. it. I got it like three years ago in Atlanta. Yeah. Um, so good, good trouble. I, I like that. I like that. Uh, Shout out to Passport OG, you know, but this is the thing, man, I'm not claiming this agenda is the end all to be all. It may be the beginning point. I mean, maybe in a couple of years, it'll, you know, it, it'll either spark or evolve into something completely different that meets our needs in a far better way. I don't know. All I know is I'm, you know, starting where I am and I'm saying, let's at least get this snowball moving and we'll change it to whatever it needs to adapt into that suits our needs as we go. Um, but I wanted to create a static place where that website doesn't change and people can access it, add to it and reference it. And it's just there. You know what I mean? So it's all on, 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 on the guys who are watching this, who are interested. Really, this is on you. What do you want to do with it? Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, one of the things I wanted to do was to help get the word out. Thank you. Uh, so, so thank you, Dr. T, for, for doing this. Um, yeah, I mean, in, in today's climate, it's so easy to get tired and feathered for saying things people don't like, uh, even if it's... Uh, substantive and even if it's uh data driven yeah it's mm-hmm. easy to get tarred and feathered today i don't have anything else everybody dr tia san johnson there is one thing i want to i want to in terms of being a, a youtuber you, you said something interesting on saturday then we'll wrap up you said uh even just getting to a thousand is is a big deal that 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 impressed me because you just said you said I only have thirty eight thousand there are a lot of people who would love to have thirty eight thousand dr t absolutely absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. But do you want to say a few words about that? Just 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 well, getting to that thousand that thousand sub cutoff. Yeah, I, you know, because that to me, um, I really wanted to big up the the brothers that are doing this work, whether they're in the manosphere formally or informally or you know adjacent to it or whatever. Your favorite YouTubers um, are far more extraordinary than you think. You know what I mean? Because uh, you know, you figure about eight point eight six percent of content creators on YouTube have over a thousand subs and all in all YouTube in and of itself has about 2.7 billion active users. So 8.86% of 2.7 billion uh, have over a thousand. So if you see brothers with channels anywhere larger than that, you're talking about those who are infinitesimally small in regard to their sample. And I think that speaks to um, how how well some of these brothers have, have managed channels. I mean, I'm seeing some of the most incredible stuff coming from guys who are just operating in their apartment. You know what I mean? Just figuring out what, you know, how to build their channels. And I think some of it is ingenious. You know, people are building careers off of this. And I just wanted to tip my hat to those brothers by putting out the statistics on that. 
So you're right. I don't mean to suggest 38,000 is nothing. I, I take it very seriously. But we do know some people are shadow banned. We do know some of these blackmail owned channels or blackmailed uh, channels could be far more than what they are if they weren't shadow banned. But at the end of the day, I still tip my hat to those brothers who are pushing the boundaries regardless and creating blackmail media. I think they need to be supported. I don't take any of it lightly. And I just wanted you to be clear when you see a brother with, you know, anywhere from 20 to 150,000 subs, understand how hard that is in a space where you have billions of people and a very small percentage that get over a thousand. That's a huge accomplishment, even when it doesn't feel like you're doing much, you know, because I know some cats with 10,000 subscribers that just feel like they're not doing well at all. And I'm like, well, compared to the people you're watching, I know why you feel that way. I felt that at times. But the reality is you're, you're part of a very small elite. And that tends to be the case with most things that people are into most things. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's not all fun and games. People look at this and they think, oh, I, I, you know, you guys are up there, you know, just wasting time and yeah. you, know, you, you could be spending that time doing something else. And uh, I, th I think a lot of youngsters say, I want to grow up and be a, I want to grow up and be a YouTuber. And it's, it's not all fun and games. No, so not at all. Most things was, aren't. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was going to say that was, that was, that was cool when I heard you say that on Saturday night that uh, I, I, I didn't, I didn't know that statistic, but yeah. no, most, most things, when, most things, when you get down to it, this is why I was talking about telling you the story between the, uh, the appliance repair guy and myself about being a professor. You think things are easy until you find out the nature of that, you know, that profession. And you find out that there is no escaping the challenge. It just presents itself in different ways based on what the profession is. But just when you think all of it is easy, it, no, it just has a different set of things. Uh, to me, I wouldn't have got where I am without BGS. Right? BGS invited me and actually challenged me to come to YouTube. And it took a long time. And then he shared his audience with me. Um, the first person that introduced the Manosphere to me was Obsidian. right? And uh, he kind of introduced that this whole space. I didn't even know it existed. And so, you know, those brothers kind of opened their channels to me and I was able to kind of get a start. But if I just started a YouTube channel and just was making content, people have no idea how difficult it can be to get recognized and to build subscribership. You have a lot of people that will watch your videos and not subscribe for years. Yep. yep. They like your stuff. They actually enjoy it, but won't subscribe. And you're just out there, you know, in the ether you know, making videos, hoping that something catches on. And a lot of people give up after a while. I've seen people that have 10 years worth of content and a hundred subscribers. Wow. Yeah, man, it's, it, it, this is not an easy road by anything. And really at the end of the day, anything you get into is competitive and it's really not an easy road. Now, if you had an easy way climbing up, that's great, but that is hardly the norm for anything. Mm -hmm. So I just really shared that data because I wanted I wanted I wanted people to know your favorite content uh, creators uh, are doing more than you think, and and we should definitely support them and acknowledge the road that they're walking because it ain't easy. Mm -hmm. All right, everybody, Dr. Tia San Johnson, Dr. Johnson, do you have anything else? I, I yeah, check the latest uh, the latest uh, comment. Um. Michael, he says, I'm the pilot. Oh, okay. Well, thank you for the super chat, first of all, <laughs> Michael. <laughs> but um, he says, I'm the politician Dr. T was talking about. There's a group of us in my city that are all working together to push forward the black male agenda. Shout out to Michael. Shout out to Michael. All right. Um, yeah. You know, and, we, and I think it's necessary. That if, you, if we can say support black male media. We should definitely be able to say support black male um, politicians who are advancing our issues and making and taking them seriously and putting them center stage. I think it's incredibly important that we support the people doing that. And if there are non black male politicians win willing to do that, tip the hat to them as well. But we should definitely support the brothers who are willing to stand on and at the podium, take office and take our politics seriously. They need to be supported. You know, so. um you know, you look at the parties, you look at the policies, you decide for yourself what you think as far as that. But they should get the first nod. And this goes back to something you said a few moments ago about the kind of politicians you're interested in. The brothers who are willing to take our politics seriously or the people, the politicians, period, that are willing to take us seriously should get the first nod. But most particularly the black male politicians who are taking these politics and putting them on the front burner. 
they need to get our first nod. You know, that, that needs to happen across the board. Okay. Well, uh, Michael, you you were in touch with Dr. T. I'd love to uh, follow you somewhere and, and learn more about what you're doing. I think everybody in the chat would as well. Mm-hmm. So um, if there's a way to follow you, uh, let us know. Let, doc, let Dr. T know. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll definitely keep my eyes on on what you're doing. Yeah. And if you ever want to talk about it, I mean, I'm I'm a I'm a small fish, but uh, if you ever want to talk about it, yeah. uh, I'd be excited to talk to talk about it. And and likewise, I mean, I've had some politicians that you know publicly they want they're interested in the politics, but they're worried about being associated with one group or another. So I get that. Yeah. I understand my limitations in terms of how much I understand the intricacies of the political world, the nuances, the under the table battles that go on that require crazy amounts of strategy. I get it. I don't take it personal if they don't want to be seen on my channel, but if they do, I'm willing to entertain that. Again, for me, the focus is, are, do you care about black boys and men? Do you take our, our politics seriously? Do you take what we think and what we have to say seriously? And as long as you do those things, you got my attention and more often than not, my support. Okay. Uh, Guy Incognito, thank you for the $5 super chat. He says, Passport OG should also have more subscribers. Very smart takes for black men. And then Michael says, I'm running for uh, state senate. We have uh, another brother uh, running for House of, the House of Representatives, and we have three others running for city council. That's okay. awesome. Tip my um, to brothers to handle that. Yeah, yeah, Michael, I will. I will look you up, or if I, if I can um, follow you through Doctor T, I'll do that. My contact info is here. My email address. That's one of my email addresses right there. Big discuss mm-hmm. seventy six at bigwordsareprofitable dot com. I know that that's a mouthful, but there are multiple ways to get in contact with me. Uh, and then I have one more super chat here. Then we'll wrap up because I need to eat something before it gets too late. It's already too late, but I need to, I need to eat something. Right. <laughs> it's early where you are. <laughs> Money Motion says, "Thank you for the five dollar the five dollar super chat." He says, "Blessings to Dr. Dunbar and Dr. Johnson. Salute to the Black Intelligentsia. Your voices are greatly appreciated." Thank you for all that you do. All right. So everyone, while you're here, I'm a STEM guy. Dr. Johnson just asked me about uh, doing something on synthetic cannabis. I did that. My science mm-hmm. channel. Thank you for that, by the way. Thank you for that. Since you're here, everyone. Uh... I think I spelled that correctly. My science channel is, is is the same as this, except it says science and technology on the end. Big discussions, 76, science and technology. I think we need to uh, make some more, gain some more ground in that, on that frontier as well. Yeah. And I was particularly interested to, in, in what you were talking about in terms of zombification, I think it was, in regard yes. to yeah. the synthetic weed. So definitely check that video out, folks. He's, he did some some tight, incredible work. Um, and we got to well, get these discussions out. I was gonna, I was going to say the other thing is that this information is controlled and it's policed. You mentioned yes. shadow banning. They initially made that video uh, uh, age age restricted, but they took it off. I don't know why they took it off, but they took it mm. off. Fortunately, but this information this is not fun and games. Yeah, uh, this 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 information is 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 controlled as well. Mm-hmm. All yeah. right. Yeah. Well, everyone, that's it. Uh, thank you to everyone who hung out in the chat and Dr. Johnson, thank you for coming back and lending your expertise and talking to us about uh, what you're doing. Oh man. Thanks for having me, man. Appreciate it. All right, everyone. You you know how I sign off. I'm not going to go through all of it uh, tonight, but I will say, uh, stay safe out there. Keep, uh, keep reading. And, uh, the, I will put the, the link to the agenda underneath the playback for this stream. So everyone enjoy the rest of your night. Thank you for the support. As always, remember that your attitude determines your altitude. Always try to do your best. Take care and uh, we will talk to you the next time. Bye-bye. Peace. Let me see.